hi everyone my name is bruce lombardo and uh with me today is the ever lovely janet from another planet hello we just finished the queen of amazon women <laughs> today yeah. she's like in in heels she's around six foot tall which is taller <laughs> than me i'm at the average height of the world five foot six and uh oh, i'm five nine Yes, Janet's five nine, but she's six foot in heels. So, we just watched this movie with our friends and saw a, a great classic, a very good skit comedy classic called "Amazon Women on the Moon." <laughs> yep. Janet, have you ever seen this before? No, I hadn't, and I can see why now. Uh, but it was it was funny. I laughed a lot. We all laughed a lot, but it was great. I loved the opening scene. Well, I was rolling with Arsenio Hall. I felt know. sorry for him. I did too, but it was so good. He was so slapstick funny. I mean, he's really, really good at, at uh, improvisation. And I just, I thought it was great. I, thought, I was laughing. It was, he was, he was wonderful. It really made me laugh. I, I saw, I saw the beginning of this movie when I was a young boy when it was on HBO and <laughs> it was over at my grandparents' house. We had a family over. Hey, Papa Cotton, how you doing? I'm glad you're here, sir. Papa Cotton, if you want in, let us know. Uh, Janet, if he messages you, give him a StreamYard link. He has a okay. pass. Yeah. Okay. I will. Um, and Baron G Rock. Seeing what all men are thinking. The girls are out to play. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we I have not been back to my home planet for a while. <laughs> well, I like men, that's why. <laughs> get the sausage warmed up for you whenever whenever you decide to take your course that way. Um you uh you saw this movie just now. I've seen this movie partially before. This is one of those great films that, like, you can't watch it around family when you're, like, under the age of 12, which I was at the time. Holy cow. The first scene is Arsenio Hall getting attacked by everything in his apartment, which is pretty family friendly. <laughs> yep. This is about as good as it gets. This movie is so good as it shows you just how talented Arsenio Hall is. And... I didn't realize that until I'm watching this today. And I'm like, no wonder he's a good pick for a, a syndicated TV show. Uh, it, it's it's amazing to see him go at it and, and just get completely beaten the hell up by his apartment. And I yeah, was laughing. Was funny. How he was able, knowing it was going to happen when he first opened the, the, the soda pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you could tell it went up his nose. Uh, in his mouth and in his eyes and everything. I, I wonder how many times they had to make that one scene because it was so funny. There's just no way. And he did not act uh, like mm. it was going to explode because I wasn't expecting it to explode. And either they did it without telling him it was going to happen or he was just really, really good at pretending that he doesn't know what's going to happen because I was, I, I was laughing my ass off when it happened to him. Because that hurts when stuff goes up your nose, you know, water and stuff. If you've gone down like a water slide or even had your soda pop explode in your face. Baron G-Rock was present one time. We had our friend Zach there. Mm -hmm. And Zach waited until I took a full swallow of Monster Energy Drink or, or Dr. Pepper. One of those two. And then Zach said something funny or did something. He, he did something. And I took all the water, all the pop. All the carbonated drink in my mouth, and it <laughs> forced itself into my nasal cavity, where I thought I had part of my sternum detached. I was in so much pain. I I, I had to lean on a chair. I was in. I was <laughs> crying. I don't remember much for the next few minutes, but no, no. Baron G Rock's right there laughing with everybody else. <laughs> and, uh, thanks, guys. You're fucking great. You're fucking good humans. Let me tell you. <laughs> Love, love you, man. But ouch, that, that was a painful memory. And I don't drink carbonated drinks except for beer anymore. Uh, yeah, I haven't had a soda in over uh, 12, 12 years. 
And when yeah. I stopped drinking, I didn't lose one pound. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that would help me lose weight. But it, I didn't lose. So I must not have really drank a lot of soda. I just I've, don't seen, I've, I've seen some of your early work and you're pretty much like you, you're the same size. <laughs> you're, well, you're, you don't, you don't look like you're quote unquote heavy. Well, I've never really been really heavy, you know, or anything yeah. like that. But I, you know, you, you, you put on a little bit of weight when you have a kid. So. Uh, okay. Okay. That's, well, that's a good thing. Cause you're supposed to feed the child with yourself. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. um, no, this, this, this movie starts off with a bang and Arsenio Hall just nailed it. And then the next sequence, the penthouse, the, the penthouse queen played by <laughs> Monique Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And she's a model going about her daily routine in Laguna, California, completely naked. Mm -hmm. That was the version we watched. The <laughs> with her purse. That she had her bag on her arm. Oh yeah, she had her purse. Talking yeah. about being able to walk in town and be uh, no, not bothered, you know, not harassed, and no one, everyone ignores her, and she's totally naked. <laughs> I don't know oh, how yeah. she did it. They're and so the fun. men, all the men that were able to just walk by, they must have been gay. They, <laughs> I, I don't know what their problem was, but like <laughs> this is a movie that my mom came in to the TV to see me and my uncle George watching mm. this film, my uncle's probably 20. Your uncle old. is the one who got you to watch this movie? Oh my he God. Was, it was on HBO. I mean. I know, but still, there's so, a lot of naughty stuff in there. <laughs> no, we didn't get to watch all of it because mom fucking unplugs the television and then tells grandma what's going on. And grandma <laughs> just gives this angry look to uncle George. Everybody else in the kitchen and me and Uncle George are in there sulking because, like, this was getting kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And I'm 12, and I, I could see humor in it, but I'm telling you, like, when you're 12, don't get caught with this movie. Not with that segment on. <laughs> and it, it was just one of those things, like, don't do it. Don't do it, young man. You're going to hear it on the ride home with mom and dad. And boy, did I ever. And and then mom, of course, you know, when you're 12, it's that cusp. For me, it was a cusp of like corporal punishment or grounding. And uh, it just, it, it didn't end well at all. So, because I got both. Well, I can see why I would do the same thing if I was um, a mom and walked in. And so my son or daughter watching this movie when they were young. Uh -uh. Okay. Now. It was if, on. If it was on TV, on regular TV, because I know they played it with edited version, and that was what I. One of the trivia things I found was that the uh, the the playmate that was in the movie, uh, totally naked, in in those scenes in the hot tub scene and everything, she uh, wore lingerie in another scene. So they in the same scenes, but was not naked, so that they could put it on television. Yeah, and and I complained about that part specifically to my dad <laughs> and, and i'm like you remember that time grandma and grandpa just moved in across the street two houses down from us but remember that time on fight drive mom pretty much yelled at me the whole way home for like 20 minutes because we were watching this film and uh this lady was naked in church and nobody else was looking at her like it's weird I think that'd be weird. This lady was smoking hot. She was beautiful. She's everything you want. If I walked <laughs> home, if I if I drove this lady home on a date, you'd say, good job, son. And Uncle George would beat me up in the kidneys and take her for himself. Because that's the type <laughs> of guy he is. <laughs> oh, well, God bless he was that a hot-blooded hot American man. Yeah, so... So anyway, you know, he, he was born in... in uh, he was born in 61. He, he's... He's he's of that mindset that he would have done that. He's he's no longer here with us, but he he would have he would have, he would have beat me in the kidneys until I would have collapsed and taken his prize. So good on him. But and I would have probably let him because it's my uncle. But this guy, like, he's watching this film with me, and mom comes in, unplugs the TV, and tells grandma what's going on. Grandma just gives me and Uncle George the look, 
And then, you know, because my grandma doesn't agree with mom all the time. Grandma doesn't like seeing me get, you know, corporal punishment all the time. She thinks my mom gets, you know, too handsy with me in that belt a lot. Dad never really beat me with a belt. Mom, on the other hand, mother was an amazing uh, uh, cowgirl with that leather. And she was she was very good with the, 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 the belts. So anyway... I'm telling my dad about this film, how they have it on TV, and it's not as funny because they've lost the humor. And my dad's like, well, what's not funny about it? He said, she's in lingerie. What? She was naked in the real movie, and nobody cared. She's talking about how great it is to go to church and continue her faith as a Playboy playmate or Penthouse playmate. Mm -hmm. And nobody's batting an eye at it. Nobody gives her side eye. Nobody stares her nipple. Out of the corner of their eye, like you know, you you know you would. You're in church next to that on the pew. They did a really good job. That's what I was saying. The the gentleman that they hired that like sitting right next to her in the church pew. Uh, I didn't notice that he even noticed that she was, you know, nude, even though I know he knew. I he was probably I, inhaling really heavily, like trying, <laughs> trying to smell at least, since he was sitting right next to her, but who knows. Life. Your Unless figure. it was a real life husband, now they're able to, for some reason, not notice their wives naked. <laughs> wow, no comment. That, that, that just completely re, <laughs> that, that that just completely solved my questions about <laughs> things. Because I'm like, oh, my wife's naked, no big deal, whatever. Wait, what, Bruce? Your wife? I don't is know naked. why that is, but Go. for some reason, Go. their wife being naked is not the same thing as seeing a lady on TV. Or shrieking or something. It's, why so, is that different? <laughs> is it because so, it's different? Yeah. yeah it's, it's the wife. Uh, whatever. I, I can see it anytime I want to. No, you can't. Your wife is only going to get naked so many times before she gets bored and starts buying D cells. Yeah. That's or right. gets a boyfriend. Um, Play with it while you have it. Yes. Yes, definitely. As much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so Monique Gabriel, for those of you that don't know who she is, she is a, uh, quite a stunner born in 62. That's a good year. 62, 63, mm -hmm. some good years for American babes. And, uh, she was penthouse pet of the month in 1982, uh, the, the Christmas month. And she was in bachelor party, which is the shittiest movie Tom Hanks has ever been in. And I happily, I never saw that one either. <laughs> I, I happily ripped the shit out of that movie with Nick on uh, toxic Tuesday. Because I think that movie is great, except for Tom Hanks. Like Tony, Tony Katain and Tom ha Tom Hanks, you could just take those two fucks right out of the movie, and the movie would gain a star. Like I just absolutely hated Hanks in that movie. I just wanted to punch him in the face. Like get the fuck off camera. Anyway, she's in Bachelor Party, and then she's in a great film called Death Stalker Two, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, because okay. Death Stalker Two okay. is. Now. Really bad American fantasy film. It's Deathstalker 2, Duel of the Titans. And uh, if you've ever wanted to see what a uh, no-budget Argentinian fantasy comedy movie is like, there we go. We'll watch that later on this year. John Lazar and Maria Skokas is in it. It's bad. It's a bad film, but it's it's fun. It's so fun that they even made a fucking RPG out of it in the early, two, early to mid-2000s. Uh, great. Great fucking start of the movie, though. First two skits out the gate. I'm laughing. I shouldn't be. I'm kind of feeling bad because I'm watching this movie with Janet. Janet's not here with me. She's not She's. She's not in the theater with me. I can Pee Wee Herman if I want to. But you you, you know that feeling when you're with somebody, like a good friend or your bestie, and like, man, I'm feeling kind of funny. Damn it. You know, you you you're all, you're alone in your house and streaming on a, a watch party. It's one thing. But you can laugh a lot. Yes. What no, it's good. Oh, <laughs> um, the part I, where um Arsenio Hall, you know, was going through his whole apartment and that someone keeps calling. Has that ever happened to you? The same person keeps calling, ask for someone, even though you said they don't they're not, there's no one by that name that lives here when other shit's going on, like you're trying to cook pasta or something. You keep burning yourself, and then the phone rings, and you answer it, and then it's this person. Hey, is so and so there? And you go, no, and you hang up. You know, it's before we had caller ID. You know what I mean? So that whole thing, I just thought was just 
I just loved it. It's one of my favorite scenes, the opening scene. It was just so good. I mean, one thing after the other, bad things happening. And then you see him get out of his car before he goes in and he walks by and there's a, a nice gentleman, you know, with a uniform on sweeping the street. You know, I, I've never seen that in my life. So I, I think it, I didn't know if it was making fun of it or what. Did, were there really people that wore uniforms and cleaned our roads and sidewalks I in the city? Day. So I don't know, but I just thought that was funny. And then he goes up to his apartment and all these terrible things happen. He's starting off with the Coke or whatever, spraying up his nose and, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and then his tie <laughs> getting stuck in the garbage disposal. I, I, how scary, you know, and, and it looked like a real sink because when he was pulling up, with his neck like that, trying to reach the, the remote, you know, or the, the little flipping switch on the wall, it lifted, you know, like I a few times uh, tried to uh, pick up the uh, handle, you know, on the, the spickety thing uh, and I couldn't get it to uh, move, you know, it was like locked or something. That's it when I've had to get a new one, but during that, and I've seen it and it, it just seemed like the sink reacted the same, like a real sink. So that would have been kind of scary to know that your tie is stuck in there. <laughs> and if it keeps eating, it, it's going to choke you to death. We can't get it off. So that was a, it was, a, it was just so realistic to me. Uh, the bad luck, one thing after the other, all happening to him. And then the dumbass that keeps calling his apartment. And then he ends up falling out the window and uh, <laughs> laying on the ground. And the guy sweeping the ground, doesn't even, he just looks up in the air like, what happened? You know, what's, what's going on? But yeah, that was a funny, I, I laughed through the whole thing. And you shouldn't laugh, I guess. That's probably why you will never see anything like this ever made again. <laughs> There'll be no, no remakes no. of this movie. They, they, no, they will never remake this movie, which uh, we, we <laughs> both talked earlier about how this movie was supposed to be the, the, the sequel to the Kentucky Fried movie, which we have yet to review. We should sometime. But like, holy shit, this movie could not, they, they could not secure the rights so they could get the name on their sequel, the Kentucky Fried movie or Kentucky Fried sequel. They could not do that. And so they just went at it. And there's a lot of callbacks to KFC or Kentucky Fried movie, K KFM. But it's it's not the same. It there, there's there's a level, there's there's a little level of difference in this movie. Um, I think this movie had like a five million dollar budget. The Kentucky Fried movie had less of a budget. But they had like more just uh, lightning in a bottle when they when they film that. I, that's the best way I can put it. Because Kentucky Fried movie, you you watch it, and for the most part, like throughout most of the film, like definitely like seventy five to eighty percent of the film, you were just fucking laughing and rolling. And this one here has probably about a seventy percent laughter rate, seventy to sixty five percent. There's some aspects of it that are just not that funny. I I found the the. Murray and video land portion to be great. I don't know why, but I just found that to be so good and heartwarming. That it was like a honeymooners esque clone. And then seeing whenever Murray was like being teleported around by his wife with a remote, like he, he ends up with Monique Gabriel. Honey, the, meet me right here. Yeah, and he was kissing her, and then she changed the channel and put him on Disney Channel. But what was really acute about that is I had an instant flashback when you first see him sitting there in his boxers and his tea uh, with a with the little TV tray in front of him and his little recliner, and the wife sitting there and she's wearing her PJs. I swear to God, I saw that every night with my parents. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, it was just adorable. I just thought it was so cute. And uh, he gets sucked into the television set, and then how the wife is gooping around with him that that was like that would be my mother, you know, playing with him and trying to put him on the worst channels possible. <laughs> That's what my mom would do if something like that would happen to him. Uh, I just thought that was really cute, it was a really adorable scene, and it did uh really make me think of the old, you know, TV shows like The Honeymooners, and uh, what was that other one? with uh, the guy that had a son-in-law and he called him Meathead. What was that yeah, show? All in the Family. Yeah, All in the that Family. Was, that yeah, was... Uh, That's what that, we were watching. DeLuise's kid, I think. So I just what? thought it was really cute. That was a really good little... Uh, what would you call these skits? Almost like a skit or an homage. 
Yeah, it was like little skits of like uh, the Twilight Zone or something. And they just, you know, made a modge podge of little uh, things. And then they threw little commercials in here and there. I just thought it was really a unique perspective of Hollywood. And they also made fun of Hollywood in, in it. You know, and they made fun of the FBI. They made fun of a lot of different things that there's just no way they could get away with doing it today. They just couldn't do it. That's us. That's right here. We, we talked a little bit about this. I don't know if he was in the back room with us whenever we were talking about it, but. Yeah, I printed it out. It's like four pages. Yeah, four pages of of actors and stuff that were in this in this movie that all played parts in the commercials or different skits. I was really surprised. The talent that was in the for how much money you said it was what? Five, Five million. million? Five million dollars to get four pages of actors. And one thing that was really interesting was the fact, let me see if I can find her real quick. I thought I highlighted her. Damn it. I'll have to go through it. But there was a lot of people that went on there uh, uncredited. They didn't get any credit for being in it. Um, yeah, I noticed that. And like, the reason, you know, what's cool but, about that is um, they, that means that they don't get any kind of like residual checks and things like that. But they had a, a they were a, a well-known actor. So when you're un, uncredited, usually that's what it means. It means that you don't get any special. You just got your check, whatever it was that they gave you. And that's it. So if you're named in there, then you're going to get something more than the other actors and stuff. But I was surprised how many there were. There was a page and over a page and a half people that weren't even credited in the movie that were big names that I remember. Well, but the Lou Jacoby and his wife are are Murray and, and Selma. Mm -hmm. And they're they're tripping through this entire freaking film. Like he's staggering through parts of sets and stuff. You can tell it's all green screen, like whenever they're doing that. <laughs> yeah, um, some of the, yeah. And and I, I I I don't think back in the day when it was at 480p at best resolution, if you have a boob tube television, you're not gonna see that little line probably. But if you had something like the projection TVs of the early 2000s or later, you definitely see it. Um that was good. The fucking doctor scene with Griffin Dune being a complete dick doctor. Oh, yeah. God, that was so stupid. And who was the actor that played her husband at the hospital? I didn't recognize, I didn't recognize him at all from anything. You don't remember? Okay, you don't remember that garbage show called uh, 30 something, do you? No. Okay. I just never, I just didn't recognize the guy at all. Sorry. This, this in, oh, that's him. That's I him. recognize that picture. Yeah, he was in uh, St. Elsewhere, 30-something. He did Eight is Enough for a little bit. Uh, he was in Split Image. Uh, he was in Children of the Corn, which I sadly remember. Uh, his wife, by at the time, by the way, is Michelle Pfeiffer. So there's the oh, reason yeah. why. In the movie or in real life? In, in, the, in both. Oh, at the really? Time, okay. At the time of the filming... He married her in 81. They divorced in 88. And then he got married to Nicole Deputron, who whoever that is, I have no idea. But he's I, in... I, uh, <laughs> go ahead. I, I just wanted to interrupt for a second. I'm trying, I was going through trying to read some of these actors that were uncredited. And mm -hmm. Ro uh, Robert Lagoda. Robert Lagoda. Yeah, he, yeah. he played... Uh, he was uncredited. Well, Bella Lagosi... Uh, was uncredited because they used archive footage. Mm -hmm. But um, what was funny is that the USC Trojan Marching Band, <laughs> that was a real name. Uh, they uh, they were not credited either. No. Christopher Wolf, who played um, the uh, Titan Man, uh, you know, the, the mascot yes. character, he was not credited. So there was uh, quite a few... Uh, I was trying to, Jenny Auger, remember her from um, the American Werewolf in London? Yep. And she Jenny, was Jenny in the movie. She played Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. 
sorry. And she she was not uh, credited. So see, there's quite a few actors in this movie there's that were least, uncredited actors. Which I there's there's really three know. skits that are on YouTube mm -hmm. that you can go hunt down. One's got Dick Miller in it. He's fucking with a ventriloquist dummy. But there's three skits and like Jenny Gutter's in one of them. Uh, there's there's some skits that are not in this film, but they were filmed for this film, and they made it onto YouTube. They made it into deleted scenes on Laserdisc and DVD. Uh, it's kind of funny because that that schlep Peter Horton is also he plays Jamie in uh, this really bad romantic comedy, which is not a bad romantic comedy. It was it was actually at the time really good, but trying to watch it today, it's going to lose a lot of the chrome on on the, the it, you'll peel chrome off of it. It'll lose some of the, the fun, but he's actually in this movie as a potential uh, date for Miss Bridget Fonda in this film. Mm -hmm. And Peter Horton, yeah, he plays Jamie. He's this guy. I just like to ride my my ten speed. So if if you want to <laughs> see Peter Horton in a completely emasculated role, this after his divorce from. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, which no offense, but Nicole Deputron, you're not going to stack up to Michelle Pfeiffer. I'm sorry. I, I'm not sorry at all. I, I, when I saw her in this movie, uh, in the, you know, in the hospital scene, I was thinking, oh my God, we have got to do the witches of East Wing movie. Really? Yeah. Don't you think that'd be a fun movie to review? Well, I guess it is. Susan Sarandon, Cher, and Michelle Pfeiffer as his wives. Remember? When, when do you want to do it? We'll have to do it in October or sometime near there. Scary because okay. it's you know for scariness <laughs> or getting close to that. But it's a good drama, and I like Jack Nicholson. Quick. All right, October sixth. It is. Let me let me pencil it in. Oh, okay. I'm gonna um, send that link in here again. Let me see if it'll work real quick. Okay. I put it in the in the chat for him because I sent it to him on X, but he says he needs it here. I hope I did it right. Oh, never done it that way before. I hope it works. Oh, I understand. I'm speaking because I'm reading. I'm not typing it. Sorry. I can't do two things at once very much. But I hope it works. But yeah, the, I was really surprised. Uh, and then when the scene came up with the woman whose husband had died, the actor that was laying in the casket, he looked really familiar. And it was really a uh, bad makeup job <laughs> they did on him. Oh, uh, like the dead guy. I mean, they made him look overly, you know, made up or whatever. I Maybe they did it on purpose because it was supposed to be comical because he had a wake or whatever you want to call it and a roast. It was a wake at a roast or whatever you call it uh, for his uh, service. And I just thought it was funny. I mean, I, I kind of felt guilty. It was like a guilty pleasure to laugh at somebody's funeral. But the, the black guy that got up there, the last uh, speaker, he was funny. I really liked him, but I, I didn't know who he was. You know, I didn't recognize him or anything. But uh, some of the stuff he's talking about, this is the first time you've been stiff since your wedding night or something. It was so you got Steve Allen, Henry Youngman. It was so funny. I was rolling, laughing at that wake. It was just, had Rip Torn was yeah. on there. I mean, it was just, it was one, two, three, like, you know, like a real good roast that my mom used to love watching those ones with um, uh, Dean Martin. Mm -hmm. The Dean Martin celebrity roast or whatever it was. Oh, my mom would laugh and laugh. She just let her, she'd, her best friend Juanita would come over and they'd watch those. They'd, they'd like set it up like a, a, a private, you know, greeting or whatever. And it, oh, it was just, it, I just had so many like deja vu moments of things watching this movie that made me think of my mom so much because my mom loved comedy and um, just little things that reminded me of it. It was great. Papa Cotton, if you want to jump in here, I put a stream a yard in that link. In yeah, come join us and talk about your movie that you love. But yeah, that um, that wake was just, and they were doing confetti and just everything. And then the fact is, she was crying, and and the two boys sitting by her, I I, I guess were her children, 
with this mm-hmm. guy. And, yeah, um, and girl, the, even the pastor or the, the, you know, that was running the thing, he was laughing. And the guy, the assistant that helps move the casket and everything, he was laughing. Everyone was laughing except for the wife. Now she was crying and being real sad. So when they came to get her to take her up there and say that it was her turn to do her speech, and then she started cutting everybody down. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I thought she they did a great job. And uh, and if her husband was, you know, if he was really that funny and that comical and wanted a wake like that where people could roast him and stuff uh, that he must have had a really good personality. So she was lucky woman to have had, had him as long as she did, however long that was in the movie, but it was funny. That was a funny uh, little skit. I thought. Um, the, the hospital portion is crazy. Oh, his, he wants your channel link. He's not going to get on here with us. Uh, okay. Hold on. Sorry. Sir. I, I thought, thought that was the link that you wanted me to share with him. I, I I did because I wanted to I wanted to have him join up with us and and discuss. But okay, that, that that's very very fine, very fine. Uh, let me get you the YouTube channel, sir. But that 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 was a uh, really funny, and then uh, the scene where that one was really good. Oh my god, that what a great prank! We could do that today and do a prank on somebody that way. Um, was the one where the guy's like, you don't have a date tonight, do you? It's Saturday night. <laughs> he goes, yeah. what's your name? And he said, uh, Roy, was it Roy? Is that what he said his name or Jay or something? I can't remember what his name was. But uh, so he looks on the on the rack and he goes down the letter and he finds the one with that guy's name on it, gives it to him. So he takes it home and you see him walking in his living room with a bowl of popcorn and a drink and he sits in his chair and he's got the TV going and we're all watching it. And then you see this woman open and she's like, hi, Roy, I've been waiting for you. Come on. Yeah, in. that's Mark McClure playing Ray. Okay. Yeah. Ray. That's what it was. And so they go in and she's like, uh, I've got dinner ready. As you can tell, as she shows the table, she goes, I'm not really hungry for that right now. You look at that, and then she takes her in the bedroom. She's like, "Help me get my dress unzipped." And he he gets up, and he's like, and he realizes it's not real; it's a video, or whatever. I just thought that was great. I just loved it the whole amazing thing. Amazing that they would they would. It was a nice piece of fiction. I thought. Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, it was like an interactive video that you could do. Uh, there, there was a um, just taking off the subject a little bit, but I watched a documentary, and it had a young man. This was like uh, a year and a half ago when I watched it. And he had murdered his mom and uh, his dad. I think maybe his sister too, but his brother was still alive. Uh, They were all grown. He was still living with his parents because he had racked up all their credit cards for some bimbo that was online. That wasn't even a real woman or real, uh, you know, girlfriend. And uh, he was paying her money to pretend like, you know, to do stuff like that, to talk to him and say, how was your work day? You know, all that kind of stuff, whatever. And uh, and he was sending her hundreds of thousands of dollars. So apparently the parents were took his cards away and they were going to have him arrested or whatever. So he killed him. So that really does happen. What what you know, that kind of terrible thing. But that whole thing was I thought was really, really funny because if you could do that and just you change the uh, name of the guy and do, you know, but I wouldn't end it the way they did it. You know what I mean? In the, in that with the Andrew Dice Clay <laughs> shooting himself in the head. And then the cops really come to his house and arrest him. I thought that was a really funny, a really funny little skit that they did. It was um, very detailed and everything, but the kid watching eating the popcorn was like, his facial expressions and stuff were just adorable. I thought he did a really, really good job. Hey, you're good, lady. You're good, sir. Um, I, I thought this movie, there, there's a part in this film right after that where you got Joe, Joe Pagliano. He's talking mm-hmm. about using carpet to staple onto your skull for uh, hair removal or for <laughs> hair yeah. plug treatment. Yeah, and, for hair plugs, basically, yeah. so you have hair. So back in the 2004, uh, we had that that uh, Lurch uh, John Kerry. He he was trying to be president, and there was an urban legend at the time around Mattoon, Illinois, where I was running D and D, where there were friends that were like, "Man, John Kerry's first court case he did 
he was uh, he was trying to get this guy millions of dollars because he had bought a hair loss treatment and they sent him carpet and he <laughs> applied it to his scalp and his, yeah. his head got infected. And mm -hmm. I've been trying since I read, since I saw that, I've been in the background looking for John Kerry's early court cases. I Please tell me it's true. Please, please, please tell me it's true. And I can't find anything. So I'm having to think like, God damn it, this thing I've been carrying around for 20 years this hope I had that John Kerry really had the mother of all fuck ups for for uh, uh, tort law. It it's not <laughs> true. I can't find any evidence of it. Maybe if somebody else has or a better it's been scrubbed Google. because he was embarrassed, you know. Maybe he paid to have it taken off. People do it all the time. They paid these big companies to go through and scrub all the bad information about them on the web. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. Today's special episode is brought to you by Delete Me. <laughs> the one thing, though, I didn't like the the worst thing about this movie to me was the one scene uh, or the 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 girl. What what's her name? The famous uh, play Playboy playmate that was naked. Oh, uh, you're talking movie? about Monique Gabrielle. Okay, that was just too far over the top for me. I could not. I wanted to get into it, but I couldn't. Whenever she spoke, she was like, "Oh." I just want to, I just, I don't know what to say. I just so, oh yeah, whatever. I just, I, I love my house and I want to, I want to stay a good girl. And you know, all that baby talk. Oh, this baby want to throw up. I just couldn't stand it. I've met so many women like that. It drives me crazy. And I have a deep voice, I guess, for a, a girl. But uh, when they do that fake voice it just oh it drives me nuts and i've seen so many girls do that and she's calling you know like what was that movie again again uh victor victoria when she won that academy award for it uh what was her name leslie ann warren yep Pookie, i'm horny you know she had that that ooh, that irritating voice i just hate it when i see so many women that do that shit it just drives me nuts i mean it's okay to try to be sexy but to put the baby talk in is just, it's, it just makes me ill. I just can't stand it. So I just hardly could watch that scene. I, I'm asking that right. to help us out and give us a good Jennifer Tilly movie to watch. That way I can hear you gnash your teeth the whole time. <laughs> yeah, she, she does have that. But she's more natural when she does it. You know what I mean? She, she doesn't seem as annoying to me as this girl did. This girl just seemed like she was putting it on, laying it on real thick, you know. For the uh, character or something, I don't know. I don't. I my bet you would talk like that. My but name is Jennifer Kelly. I'm looking to have my like, film oh, be reviewed by Janet. Another hot. Can you turn the fan on for me? I'm really sweaty. For you those of you with, type, with uh, XY type chromosomes, you may be experiencing a little tightness in your pants or shorts. <laughs> Go ahead, Danica. It's just so bad. If any of you guys like girls like that, you guys really need to think about it because that's the fakest shit ever. Because anybody can do it if they want to. But uh, you don't want a girl that talks like that all the time. There's, you, she's going to cost you a buttload of this. I can tell you that for sure. Because remember, I'm a tomboy. And I have lots of friends that are uh, bimbos like that. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, yeah. Mm -mm. It's not worth it so, in the long run. <laughs> what did you really think about the uh, the part where David Allen Greer and B.B. King were talking about blacks without soul? I thought it was great. I loved it. I loved everything with David Allen Greer. He is just so freaking talented. He can really sing. He's funny. Uh, I absolutely fell in love with him uh, when he was on In Living Color and he did the men on film. Yes. Him and Damon Wayans. Oh my God. He's so oh my funny. God. Up in a circle. Him. <laughs> he's just funny and talented. It, it takes a lot though to be believable um, and be able to do that and do it with such precision and to sing. Okay. It's, you know, he can he's actually sing and carry a tune. So I don't know. I just really like him. I think he's funny. I loved him in Jumanji too. I thought he was so good he's so funny he's just really talented listen if did you, you like that i i love jumanji but if you boys want to see more more shows on this channel with my friend janet like this i need you all to like share and subscribe and make <laughs> sure
that you subscribe to Janice YouTube. You're her friend on Twitter. You do everything you can to be Janice's best buddy because I want Janet to be magnanimous. I want her to be huge. Well, I don't ask in any of my videos. I, I never ask anyone to subscribe to my channel. I do not ask any of them. Well, I'm going to ask them for them. Boys, men, ladies of culture, I need you to put two snaps up in a circle and give this the thumbs up approval. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize uh, that Papa Cotton says he had his ch channel nuked. Yeah, he, he, he said that earlier, and I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, I'm so sorry. Hey, I, I got taken down for three weeks. So, uh, yeah, they don't like me very much either, and I'm not even monetized or anything. <laughs> they just don't like, you know, when I start doing some of my political stuff, they don't like it. No. It's okay for me to, you know, jiggle and jump around and act all goofy and stupid, but if I start good. saying that Joe Biden's a, 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 a douchebag, then uh, they'll take right. my channel down. <laughs> so it's like, wow, yeah, okay. Just talk yeah, about movies. Talk about you can talk about TNA and all that shit, but you can't talk about the truth about your president or your government. Yeah, it sucks. Trump won. Trump won. <laughs> it's sad. I mean, yeah, I got taken down. Obviously, I had three strikes. My third strike was the medical, supposedly mis medical misinformation. The second one was because I put that comet ping pong video up about podesta and hillary's emails and stuff so it's like and the first one was because i kept saying pedophile i wouldn't say minor attracted persons so oh well isn't you know. that what a minor attracted person is is a pedophile well, well i guess it is bruce not to them but that just proves to me that you know and when every survey i get when they say do you plan on making it blah 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 through youtube and i'm like as soon as i can get my people to go to rumble i'll see ya I'll put nothing but chicken videos out over here or something, but, um, you know, but I'm still going to do this because I, I love doing this. This is fun. As long as, you know, you and I get to do it, I'm going to keep doing it because this is, I, I look forward to this every week, getting to watch a movie I hadn't seen or getting to see an old movie I haven't seen in a long time and, and, and hanging out and talking about it because I love talking as anybody can tell. <laughs> so. So, so what uh, else about the movie do, can we talk about? I'm trying to remember some more of it. It was so much packed about into this movie it. Is so fucking good. The the Blacks Without Soul seeing that one black lady say, "As a Republican, our lives have improved so much." And <laughs> yeah, and they're on a golf course in a in a buggy <laughs> after the whole Clinton thing. When they that's another thing, you know. Uh, my mom and them were in Arkansas when Hillary and. Uh, uh, her husband ran for governor the first time and he didn't win didn't win and a lot of it was because he went to a golf course he had, he was a regular at a golf course or attending or whatever you call it a a member of a golf course it was all white it was for all white people and so you know stuff like that comes out and nobody gives a shit and the democrats still vote for him even though he's blatantly they're blatantly racist you know and then hillary comes out and says that she uh her mentor was that guy that was the KKK Ku Klux Klan leader, you know, and stuff like that. And nobody Mr. cares. Senator Robert Byrd, Cleveland, yeah, Robert the Byrd. grand wizard of the KKK. It's just sickening. It's just sickening to me. You know, I'm white and I have lots of guy friends and girlfriends and white friends and Hispanic friends. You know, I don't pick people because of their skin color or whether they're a man or woman. I pick up my friends because of their character and if they make me laugh, if they're honest with me, if they're fun to be with, you know, spend my time with. I just I just wish more people could do that instead of saying, well, I have to be friends with that person because they got a little D beside their name. <laughs> Something is so stupid. Colors. You can have friends of these colors. You can have friends of these colors. Nope, no beast. You can have friends of these colors. You can have friends of these colors. That's wow, you got a lot of paint. And you can have friends of these colors. And you can have friends like these colors. Especially if they're head colored like that. Mm -hmm. But if you have these friends like this, they better get down on their knees and pray and hope and hope that DEI is kind to them. They better get some hyphenation going on. They better be part of the Wi Fi crowd. They better accept the <laughs> transgender as their loads and saviors. If they don't do that, then what's going to happen 
is DEI is going to come on. Bridge is going to come on. That's the big demon right now, Bridge. Y'all thinking we beat DEI. DEI is almost dead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, nope, nope, nope. Bruce is going to show you all something. Bridge <laughs> is on the horizon. Bridge is going to fuck up everything, America. America is going to get fucked up. Let me let me show you what I'm talking about. Bridge D. Okay, so coming on the horizon, you you thought you thought that I was joking. Nope. What is this? Wearebridge.com. This is the insidious new future from hell, from people who brought you Moloch worship, child transgender bullshit. From the people that are giving your kids drugs, not telling you about it in their fucking public schools on your tax dollars. This is a purpose-driven community based to action focused on the workplace, workforce, and marketplace. The bridge mission is to create a cultural shift in companies where DEI principles flow through all facets of an organization from the C-suite and marketing through the product development, mm -hmm. procurement, and customer service. That means the people that sell it directly to you. You'll be forced to give money to this bullshit. And this is the demon on the horizon. This is the Bale and Moloch worshippers' golden egg. This is what's going <laughs> to fuck over America and Western civilization all at once. You thought you were finished with DEI? You thought that Sydney Sweeney had saved you with her big tatas? Nope. <laughs> This is coming, and it's going to splooge all over your money, and it's going to get all over your kids, and your world, your Western civilization will not be the same. Long-term goal. Here it is, right here. Go ahead, take it, Mr. Klaus Schwab. Our long-term goal, with the help of our founding <laughs> board members composed of DEI and business leaders, is to create a comprehensive bridge agenda for all the companies and to subsequently certify against its implementation and measure its impact. Next next slide, please. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bob, thank you. So join us for Bridge 24, May 7th, 5th through 7th in La Jolla, California. That's where that gay guy, the governor, what's his name? Gruesome Newsom? Mm -hmm. Inclusion is good for business. Yes, be part of it. Like I said, see these colors over here? Don't be part of that peach and apricot apricot crowd don't you dare be no apricot mm -mm. you better be dark brown you better be a poc receive the most recent and impactful bridge dei news events and best practices once a month directly in your inbox fuck these people fuck these people i can't wait till the palestinian fucking demanding crowd goes over there and says how dare you? you're not stopping israel from killing the mosque and by the way, Israel st keep keep bombing the shit out of Hamas. I love it. I love seeing their tears. That's my fucking ketchup and fucking taters right now. Hey, Jackie Blue. How you doing, sweetheart? All right. So. <laughs> um, the other part was the one where um, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember the name of the actors. I'm so I like good. Rosanna Arquette and Steve Gutenberg doing the blind date. Oh, yeah. That whole dating thing. That was a really good idea because basically every single thing that happened in this movie is really happening right now. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the dating aspect of it and stuff, it's just that they didn't have um, they didn't have they didn't have cell phones back then, did they? In 85 no. or 87. They, they, they did, but you had this large phone that was the size of a small briefcase or your purse. If you're a... Oh, that's right, those with, bag phones. A those bag phone, bags. and you had a suitcase in the trunk of your car. Bad so light phones. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I, but, I didn't... Uh, nobody that was had no didn't have money. <laughs> they didn't have cell phones. Because yeah, I don't remember people having any. But uh yeah. that's what it reminded me of was all the different things that were happening. Like when they in the in the pirate scene, when uh they, they opened the treasure chest at the end, and that was a very elaborate, the whole thing with the costumes and the set. They they spent a lot of time and money on that uh on that whole one. And the uh, the other one with the um the wake. You know, when they were yes. roasting the dead guy, 
you could tell they spent, it was very elaborate. So I, I, I wish I'd look to see who directed each of the different segments because what, what, what do you want to know about? Uh, I'd like to know about the, uh, the pirate one and the, the wake one for sure, because they, they were had to have been really good directors because they really paid attention to all the details in the set and on the costumes and everything. It was just really phenomenal. You could tell that these people had an eye for everything. I mean, when they were looking at around the room, they wanted to make sure it looked a certain way. And you just don't see that in every single, you know, you're not going to see that on a director that directs it day for, days of our lives. You know what I'm saying? So that's what was good. But when he opened that treasure chest and it was filled with all the, the DVDs or those, what was it? VHS tapes. And mm -hmm. then they took one out and they put it in the box and then and it said pirates. Yeah, it was a pirated, you know, because they stole it. And then it showed the FBI, you know, as warning, and they were like, Oh, I'm really, really scared, you know. They made fun of it. I just thought that was funny because so video pirates was directed FBI by right <laughs> Robert K. Weiss. Robert K. Weiss did uh that video pirate segment, which I thought mm -hmm. was fucking gold. Uh too, John Lando. Uh, he had to skip out because not only did, was he released on, on Bond while his trial was going on, he was making this movie. He did Mondo Condo, the hospital scene, Blacks Without Soul, Don No Soul Simmons, and Video yeah. Date. Now, after he did the finish up Video Date, he took off and directed the movie Three Amigos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mom this really channel, too. This channel, I myself personally, um, as much as people want to deride John Landis for the accident that happened on the set of Twilight Zone, which I've been ripped open on Nick's channel before for defending John Landis's work and his body of work throughout his many, many decades in film. Mm -hmm. Um, and Red Letter Media gets grief too whenever they praise John Landis for the things he's made because he was a director on scene during the night shoot that killed Vic Morrow and the two young ladies that were in Vic Morrow's arms. Mm -hmm. Now, every fucking one of us in 2024, every fucking one of us is told at our job that if you feel like something's unsafe, you have every right to demand we stop action, stop kinetic work, and immediately go back to the drawing board and try to figure out something safer. Mm-hmm. And during that night shoot, during that night shoot, there was an excess. You know, Mikey Sue's for Janet. Uh -uh. No, I don't know who that is. Mikey where Sue's where where are they at? He's popped into uh, the the green room. Mikey, let me know in the uh, private chat who you are before I allow oh, I you. I think in. that was because of the link that I shared. Okay. Uh, I was sharing it with Papa, though. Okay. Um, so. This, this, uh, the, the entire thing about John Landis is that everybody that was there on site, all 30 people there, had the right to stop the action. Each and every one of them. It's mm -hmm. not just John Landis's ownership of that. Everybody there is partially to blame for Vic Morrow's death, along with the two young Vietnamese ladies. And I'm sorry that some people may get upset about this, but this is the truth. Every one of us at our jobs owns safety. Every fucking one of us. Because if we're not safe, then it's on us. So those 30 people are part to blame for this. They, they just roasted John Landis. They took money out of his, his livelihood. But he's not the only one that was responsible for that, including Vic and the two young girls, which I'm sure the young girls were scared shitless, but they were thinking they were kids and had no no beef. They had no ability to to defend uh, their their safety. And I am very certain that's what happened from their perspective because I was the same age. If you would have told me like you're going to be carried in this guy's arms when a helicopter lands and it'll be fine, no big deal, you would be scared shitless. But and that would look good for film, but you wouldn't have enjoyed that filming segment no matter what. Now everybody's had things going on that night. I understand it, but John Landis is not the only one to blame. And it's a shame that that happened. This is why CGI exists. This is why miniatures exist. It sucks, but I really don't have any beef with John Landis. I mean, 
not saying that the court was right in uh, exonerating him or, or, or raking him over the coals for a little bit, taking his money and then saying, okay, you're free to go. No big deal. No, you know, it's a shame about Mr. Mr. Morrow, but you know, you're going to be a better director from here on out. And I wouldn't doubt if actually after that, that's kind of one of the things that contributed to today's safety conscious environment in film industry, because nobody wants to have that go on. Now, mind you, that was thought of on the set of The Crow. No, or more recently, was it thought of on the set of Rust? But yes. mm -hmm. the set of Rust, they didn't have 30 people there. They had less than less than 10 people were there when you have dumbass Baldwin plinking around with a fucking gun, shooting at a goddamn director of photography. Mm -hmm. Without Rusty. checking the gun. Yeah, and, and he, the armor was, was absolutely unequivocally unqualified. That's I think she's been charged. I mean, she has been, uh, you know, convicted. Mikey, just send us. Okay, we met before. Okay, Mikey says, we met before. Janet through deleted scenes. Tony Stark of Iron. We both know Cardinal Sin. I've subbed and have. Okay. All right, Mikey. I'm bringing you in. We'll talk Has about it. Has he seen film. the movie? Yeah, have you seen? Have Mikey, you seen have you Women seen? on the Moon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did see it. Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, the one thing I was going to talk about real quick was the scene with Ed Begley Jr. Jr. The Invisible Man. Yeah, he's sitting at the thing. Because remember, I hadn't seen this before. So he's sitting there all wrapped up. And he's got the fake uh, glasses and nose on, right? The Groucho yeah. Marx set. And then uh, the, the other gentleman comes in and they're, they're talking to him. And he's talking about how he he, he solved the whole thing. And he, he's invisible, blah, blah, blah. So when he starts taking off his stuff, I'm expecting him to be invisible. But then he isn't because he's nuts. You know, he's just a crazy guy, right? I just thought that whole thing was great. And he and he's a lot better actor than I expected because to be able to keep your composure and stuff when you're running around doing comedy naked is really one of the hardest things you can do uh, in, in well, acting. Right. Well, the first the first time I was uh, when I knew of Ed Bakley was, of course, St. Elsewhere, right? He was in the uh, on that TV show. Mm -hmm. He was with all the other doctors and stuff, and he just looked cool and whatever. But I never knew that he was, you know, I always thought he was just talented in TV. But then, of course, when you see him in a couple of films, you're like, wow, Ed Bagley Jr.? Yeah. You know, he's just uh, he's just amazing. Uh, and as of Six Nations, well, I got familiar with Jeff Tilly or Jennifer Tilly uh, through, uh, obviously, through the Chucky franchise. But also, uh, her, her sister, Meg Tilly, Oh my gosh, what a talent. She is, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think Meg's better than Jim. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I'll agree with that completely. Well, you got to remember, too, it really has to do with the with the uh, scripts. Because yes. look how good um, the two actors that were in the Marvel movies that played the uh, Scarlet Witch and uh, Hawkeye. Okay, and yes. they, were in, they were in Wind River. And when I saw Wind River first, okay, then I saw them in the other parts, and I was like, "What happened to them? <laughs> they were great. I mean, they were uh, to me. They were they could have been nominated for awards. That's how good they were in Rin River together, and the way that they played off each other, and the the way they they played their characters in that movie. Then I saw them in their characters on that, and I was like, it, it was it was kind of a little bit of a letdown to me because they were yeah. so good in Wind River, and they were okay." As the Marvel characters, you're even really though I think Marvel still Hawkeye, I, what? You're giving Marvel movies a lot of credit there. Hawkeye was com was criminally underplayed. Well, yeah, yeah but I, I agree. Because I mean, Jeremy Renner, well, to be fair, Jeremy Renner, they didn't give him much to do, right? So, I mean, but yes, if you look, if you look at Hawkeye in the comics, okay, and then you look at, and then you look what Jeremy played in Avengers and all the other thing. You're right. He's criminally underrated. He's not given a lot to do. He should be doing more. And mm -hmm. so should Black Widow. You know, Scarlet played her really well. I think she did. And I just, you know, but um, yeah, but well, you're wasn't. right. I mean, we're just not giving Scarlet, a lot of stuff to do in the Not movie. Scarlet Johansson. I'm talking about the Scarlet Witch's character. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's Scarlet uh, Witch. She was right one of from the twins' uh, sister. What was her name again? Elizabeth Olsen. Yep, Elizabeth yeah. Olsen. Elizabeth yeah. Olsen, and they were so good in Wind River, 
And uh, it, it just, it's a crying shame when you can take someone that has that talent and give them a, a okay script. And uh, it, it's not sort of their a fault. Very good. Right, actors, the script yeah. wasn't very good. I so. agree. Elizabeth was under underused. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, well you could say both of them were. Jeremy was. Yeah, so I'm saying it's both their characters. And, but Our character. Know, because I Good. saw Wind River is the only reason I noticed. See, someone who hadn't seen Wind River and they see them as Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch, they're not going to uh, realize that they're lower on the totem pole uh, in this movie compared to what they, the talent they have that they could be because they weren't given well, the, a good script <laughs> to give I them more. It. Well, the actor, right? who was the actor that played... Um, so we're talking about Avengers. Who was the actor that played Quicksilver? I wish Quicksilver had had more of a role, more of a pivotal oh, role. Yeah, he was good. Um, Sony or, his name or, or uh, Disney's Marvel? Age, Age of Ultron. Uh, uh, Quicksilver. He was the yeah the Quicksilver that was in American Horror Story. The same actor. That's who I liked. He's yeah, good. yeah. Quicksilver was. Right, in Age of, of Ultron, um, the guy that played Quicksilver was the brother of Scarlet Witch. Mm -hmm. So when he yeah, the character, like, he died quickly, the actor, the actor yeah. that played, I'll have to look it up real quick. Let me see. I'll pull it up. Okay. In Age of Ultron, the gentleman that played Quicksilver is <laughs> he's not on the first page. You got to go to all cast and crew. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I think it's a lot of IMDb myself, Bruce. Yeah, he's, he's down the list. Um, okay, he's Aaron Taylor Johnson. Aaron Taylor Johnson, that's him. Okay, his his yeah, most been, recent, his yeah, most recent film was uh, the Fall Guy, which has yet to be released. He did Bullet Train in twenty two, right. And uh, did he do um, did he do Kick Ass and or was that the other guy? Um, he, he was in Kick Ass, Ass as Kick Ass. He was, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, he, you know, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. There's rumors that he is the front runner for the next James Bond, and he's young enough to play it. I kind of hope he gets it because he was good in the King's Man. I don't know if you saw that one or not. I've seen Kingsman. Yeah, the the, the third one came out in twenty one. That goes back to World War One. Uh, he actually, he's one of the best fight scenes in that movie is against fucking uh, uh, the, the Mad Prophet of Russia. Uh, yes, I'm you ever seen one? Yeah, right it's very now. good. But it's, yeah, it's uh, hope... Ralph Fiennes and Jim Ar Arterton. Yeah, that that's a really good film. Uh, Ralph Rasputin's played by Rhys Ifans, which I've never heard of that guy before this nor after, but he. He's really good in that movie. Yeah, Rezai fans. Um, let's see uh, if I can look him up. Yeah, he spells his name R H Y S I F A N S. Mm -hmm. so, he yeah. was in Notting Hill in '99. He played Spike. Right, he Snowden in 2016 as Corbin O'Brien. Loved and him in Snowden. Yeah. Anonymous, he played Earl of Oxford in The Amazing Spider Man from 2012. He was yeah. the, the lizard Dr. Kirk Connors. But he, yeah, that's thought, right. Dr. Kirk Connors, right, right. He played the best role in uh, Greg, as Gregory Rasputin in The King of Man because he just completely played the mad fucker, the mad oracle, just to the hilt. And that's that's a hell of a role. Yeah, there it is. The King's Man. Yeah, I see it right in front of me. Uh, he did Hannibal Rising. Yep, I remember him in that. Uh, let's see. Official secrets. Yeah. One of our one of our uh, our, our dirty campaigner lady says Nani oh, Hill. He was a Nani Hill, yeah. Great one with uh one of the few I liked with Julia Roberts in it. Yeah, it was good. I liked him in that one. Hawkeye in the comics is a lower tier character. No matter how hard they push him to be top tier, he never gets a big following. And even Iron Man was middle tier for Marvel. That's a lot of people's favorites, Mr. Flady included. I agree. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. had to had to play the role his way, or it couldn't have been any other way. So <laughs> that's how I truly feel. Like after 
Like after you did the first Iron Man all those years ago, and then you said, you know what? Now I know what to do for Tony Stark. I know what I have to do. So then, you know, he just kept doing the thing that he realized what, what Tony Stark was really all about because he actually read the comics. And he says, okay, this is what I need to do for him. And, of course, he was great, like in everything he did up to Endgame. So, yeah, definitely. I, 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 I love this movie. Now, Amazon Women on the Moon, this, we, we've talked about half the sequences so far. Do you have anything you want to add on the things like, you know, the uh, apartment uh, mishaps or the Monique Gabriel model going around Laguna, California, or Murray and Selma? Or the uh, hospital uh, uh, birthing situation with Mich Mickey, uh, Michelle Piper and Peter Horton. Did, did, yeah. Is that, okay. Sure. Let me. Um, the actor I, think I was deserves... thinking about, I'm sorry, it took me a little while to find him, was Evan Peters. Evan Peters is the character that I thought did the best Quicksilver. And I think he was in uh, one of the X-Men movies, but I'm, I'm trying to remember which one, when he was trying to find out. Um, Days of Future Past? Huh? Days of Future Past? Maybe. I don't remember. He was trying to find out who his father was. He found out it was Magneto. And he was down in the basement eating a bunch of Twinkies and stuff. And he Is saved everybody from the fire in the, uh, in the, uh, in the school. That's remember, he got everybody out. For the, he does it, that for, and doesn't there isn't there also a sequence where he runs around a room as gunfire yeah. breaks out and he's, yeah, and he's moving bullets, bullets out of the way and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Water's flying around yeah, back really so I've, yeah. I've gotten to work with him before, and he's a really good actor and he's really talented. He's really nice. Evan Peters. I couldn't remember what his name was, but uh, I knew his name was Evan, but I couldn't remember his last name. So I was like, damn, I can't remember because he dates uh, um uh Emma Roberts actress from American Horror Story. That's who he dated. So uh, I was just trying to remember, but I loved him. I thought he did a really good Quicksilver for the character. Why is that? I, I think, remember the comic books. Yeah, I think the one scene, Bruce, that probably stands out to me is Joe Pantoliano. <laughs> the, 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 the hair carpet salesman. Okay. <laughs> the hair I carpet thought all of it was there. funny. Yeah, really well, cool. I, I had to look it up because I had to verify for sure. But, uh, yeah, um, this guy, you know, is trying to sell, uh, you know, hair pieces, uh, you know, for bald men. And he uses carpentry. <laughs> he uses carpets. And I was like, uh, well, really? And he says, oh, I want it red. So then he goes and gets a red carpet. And it's shagged. And he says, you really want this for your hair? Yes. <laughs> and he <laughs> goes after it. I, I just, it, it was hilarious. One well, guy was it, wearing blue shag. Somebody was wearing red. Somebody was wearing um, some of that. You, you remember Janet beige? Like there was like a beige kind. There was like yeah, so there was a bunch of. But colors. it reminded me of all those uh, commercials from those channels that you get on cable when you pay for it and you don't want them. Those infomercials. Yeah, the hair for men. The hair yeah. for men. Yeah. And it's a can. Exactly. You know, remember the one? It was in a can, and they sprayed oh, yeah, it on. Spray on, yes. It was a yes, spray on, and it was like it had little hairs or something <laughs> in it, and it was all like it looked, but you couldn't get it wet because I remember they used it on people with bald spots. So yeah. uh, when it would rain or whatever, it'd be running <laughs> down their head. Oh, but it for reminded sure. me of I that movie it. of come back to America or come to coming to America when uh, America. the kids Booth with Arsenio Hall and uh, and they were and Andy, Mur and Andy Murphy, yeah, had a can of Jerry Curl or whatever. Jerry it was. Curl that he'd spray on, yeah. yes. And he was leaning against the couch, and when he stood up, the back the couch was like covered with all. <laughs> oh pieces. my God! So such a great film. Disgusting. It really but is. That's what it reminded me of all these little uh, commercials because I remember there were, it used to be uh, I think it was on Saturday Night Live where they used to do fake commercials too and there's yeah, a there few was... shows like um, I trying to remember some of them they used to have all remember. the fake commercials and I believe there was I thought yeah. That was funny. yeah I believe there was a segment um, when John Belushi was still alive and he was advertising some some hair pieces and uh I think Dan Ackward was helping him, and uh, they were like, he was going to nail it on his head, you know, just take like a board and, you know, and 
and the hammer nail and just go, you know, just put it right into his head. They were using a stapler, weren't they, on this movie? Didn't they use a staple gun? Yeah, they used the staple gun. That's right. Yeah. That had to have hurt really bad. That's oh. why I like wigs. You know, wigs, you can be any color hair you want as long as you want. It can be spiky, it can be short, and, and they're nice. They're yeah, nice. and I remember those. I'm yeah, and I do remember those old commercials. <laughs> oh, yes, Janet. Oh, I remember those old commercials where they had hair club for men. My Lady dad was afraid of it because he had short hair, right? Yes, right. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then I said, well, Dad, they literally grow it out of your, your, your uh, scalp. He says, well, that doesn't sound right. I said, well, I don't know, you know, if they grow it like grass or something, you know, it's it's weird. And yeah, uh, I've seen that. That was on one of those shows, like Mad TV. I yeah. think it was a thing where they they you spread these seeds on your head and you put water on it, and then gra that little the little chia pet stuff started growing. <laughs> remember that? I think that was on Mad TV, but I remember that. That was funny. So the you know all those little things. That's why I was thinking this was like a collection uh, that was uh, thrown on the floor or whatever. Uh, from uh, you know all the different shows and all these directors and producers got together and said, "Hey, we got all these cute little skits. We need to make a movie or something, and let's yeah. just you know, get together and make these and see what actors would like to uh, portray these uh, characters for all these different skits." And I thought it was pretty cute because it reminded me a little bit of what was it? Was it called um, Kentucky the, Fried Movie? Yeah, that, it's but it reminded me of the one with Drew Barrymore, and um, it was three cat's eye, cat's eye, yeah, different little segments all put together. And that one was in the plane with the creature that was tearing up the engine. John Lithgow wasn't that him That's Twilight that? Zone. Twilight well, that was Twilight Zone. One. Well, it was it reminded me of that. It reminded me of Cat's Eye and Twilight Zone movies with all the little skits now the sad thing is though i wanted to dress up as the amazon queen and the movie wasn't even really about amazon women on the moon it was just a teeny, <laughs> teeny version of it so i was you know because i hadn't seen the movie so i had to look at set photos and try to come up with something as close as i could uh you know to kind of resemble what she looked like in theme of the of the movie but the only thing is is that it was just a very small portion but i do remember all the interruptions when my parents yes. would watch TV because it was only three channels when I was right. a little kid. And I remember tons of commercials all the time. It was like all they the were selling time. cigarettes and there was all the time. It seemed like cigarettes all the time, but my mom never went without a cigarette. So I'm yeah, so that's, that's still one of my, that's still one of my favorite scenes. Uh, I even though, you know, my, my wife Suzanne and I are, are diehard cat lovers. Right. And, and, uh, you know, there's Cat Spa, Cat People, Cat's Eye. You know, we love all yeah. of those cat movies. Uh, it's so cool. But like that first segment, which had James Woods, and he had to quit smoking. And they threw the cat on oh, the yeah. electronic yeah. thing. And I was like, oh, are you kidding yeah. me? Put it, You're put it, you're in the room where they get shock treatment. Yeah, the <laughs> shock treatments. Yeah. And I was like, why are you putting the cat on the shock treatment thing? And that one guy was laughing and everything. Oh, my gosh. Oh. You see, terrible. I talk about I'm, that a lot uh, on spaces about how uh, you react differently when someone you love is in danger. So yes. to compromise people, you know, they, they don't have to, you'll do whatever you, they tell you. If they say you do what we say, or we're going to hurt your kid, you know, right. you're going to jump out of bed so and do whatever. Bad. That's just what yep. happens. And that's why that part that you were talking about with James Woods was yeah. believable. And he's a good That's actor. Unbelievable. Like, well, know, and then he cuts his, and, and then uh, I don't know, has everybody else has seen it already? But at, towards the end of that segment, he cuts his his wife's thing, you know, off, like mm -hmm. part of her finger off. Yep. Yeah, his buddy's his buddy's wife. Okay, his buddy's wife yeah. that had the cut finger. Yeah. And uh, but still, one of the funniest things with Drew was the the uh, troll that was in the in the in the wood, you know, in the wall. Mm -hmm. And my favorite scene still from that is. Get him, General. <laughs> and you got the police playing on the on the, on the uh, photograph. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, the police is, you know, I grew up the, with the police is my favorite band ever. And uh, I've met Sting <laughs> from a distance. We, like, waved to him, said hello, whatever. No, uh, and I've been to, like, you know, when he was solo, I've been to, like, eight of his concerts. And I went to both police concerts in 
1983 and the reunion in 2007. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, my God, so cool, Janet. My favorite band. And you got this cat chasing the troll all over the place. Oh, my yeah. God. Good That's movie. great. Great cool. effects. And that, and that was directed by, that segment was directed by Joe Dante himself. And I was like, oh, great, man, the guy that did Gremlins. I was like, yes, absolutely, positively great. Yeah, I was really surprised that this movie didn't make as much make more money than it did I because it did. seemed like yeah, this kind of stuff was pretty popular in the uh, in the eighties, you know. And they spent five yeah. million, which is pretty cheap. I mean, honestly, with the, yeah. I mean, like I showed, I, there's over four pages here of actors, and a, a, a page and a half of them are uncredited. So. We know they're not making, they weren't going to make extra money for playing these different characters. But for the people that did uh, be in there, they, because I guess because they had such small roles, like, like David Allen Grayer is probably has more money. He was paid more because he was in so many different sections of this, of this movie with all the singing commercials and stuff. Cause don't you guys remember those that, you know, this, get this album, it's got this, that, and the other, all these different songs on it. You know, like I, I can't remember all of them, but I have Columbia, Columbia House, There's something with the all the different stuff. It's got like ten or twelve uh, different famous artists, you know, that are uh, and get this yeah. record or whatever type thing. And then you had um, all the other ones, the infomercials, like I was talking about. It seemed like they were everywhere on every channel, but we only oh, had yeah. like, late night. Late night, they would advertise. We just talked about this in one of our previous uh, topic streams about two weeks ago about nostalgia times. We were just talking about the Columbia record house, you know, where I got involved in the contract and that was the, that was probably one of the dumbest things I ever did. Cause like I ordered the eighties hits, right. At the, whatever mm -hmm. was going on at the time that was, you know, big hits and I got it. And then I was like, but then I'm like, I want something else. But then I'm like, I didn't want to be trapped into a contract. So I said to them, yeah. look, I, you know, I'll take one more, you know, one more, uh, you know, these were cassette tapes too. Remember Janet? So, uh, at the time, so I took a cassette of another, you know, greatest hits album. And I said, that's it. I'm done. And they said, no, you're not done yet for 1999. You can also get another, you know, and they kept sending me mail, mail, mail. I said, I'm paid off. I'm done. I just paid you guys. And, uh, it took almost three months to finally stop, you know, and it was just, they kept bugging me and bugging me and sending me letters and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Time like books, time like books did the same exact thing. I think it yeah, all came from the had, same company. They even had commercials, I remember, for like sets of encyclopedias, you know. Yes. And yes. they had kids sitting around the table with their parents looking at the books and this is teach your kids from home, you know, the real history and a uh, science and all these different things. And now you don't I you never see that. Man, do we need to start selling encyclopedias? <laughs> well, we need to sell, well, we need to sell collections like that again. What they need to do is they need to open these really nice mom and pop bookstores again. You know, people that really believe in in reading books. You know, and a lot of the well, kids today you have that a number. lot of those. They're thrift stores, and then yes. you have the little um, boutiques, is what they usually call yes. them now. Like in down in the quarter, they would have a lot of boutiques, and they'd sell old books, and they sell. Uh, old jewelry, antique jewelry, and clothing, you know, things like that. So you can still find it if you're willing to, you know, really dig around and search to find some really good stuff. But today uh, it's hard to even get a good book anymore because they're all remade. You know, they, all the yeah. old books that we used to read when we were little, uh, you can't hardly get anymore. You can't even get a Disney movie uh, that's printed the same as it was when we were little. Back because when we were little, redone yeah. them. they've redone them all to make them woke, you know, because uh, uh, <laughs> we're all racist, we're all racist and mean, and we hate real, uh, oh, we hate, God. we love real women, we don't want a woman that's not really a woman, you know, that type of stuff. So they'll, oh, they'll cool. fix all that. They, they're making all those changes and fixing all those. So it's going to be hard, you know, when our grandchildren one day uh, want to watch a movie or read a book to get actual factual information because it's all going to be the new stuff whatever the new digitized version of it is just like some of these uh wikipedia and stuff people like you and i can just sit in there put information on there you know? yeah exactly i think also you know? 
Well, because now everybody's we got gonna be, books, right? everyone's going to be transgender. You know, it won't be long, and we're all going to just be Barbies, and we're not going to have any genitals. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to be all gender. the babies. All you know the babies and stuff to be raised in laboratories. You know, and they'll make they'll they'll take the very best cells from everyone, and that's where mm. our the the next generations will come from because they don't want us uh, to procreate in the normal way. You know, that's, that's why they're true. wanting everyone to not be, uh, you know get surgery and become what you aren't just so that you can feel better about yourself, <laughs> that type of thing. So it's really oh, yeah. sad, but you know, yeah, that's, that's sad. I, 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 going. Right. I remember, uh, well, I just, you know, I'm old enough to remember when they did Molly, you know, when they cloned her, the sheep. And uh -huh. I was like, you know what? I guarantee you in 20 years or so, you're going to have human beings actually cloned from a, from a test tube like you did for Molly. I've already seen, um, uh videos and stuff or uh what do you call those uh, conventions or whatever you can go to to buy different things to where yes, one day yeah. can have your baby and ha bring it home and have it mm -hmm. in a uterus growing right there in your house basically well you don't even you know you know it that's the thing too you don't even need to be man and woman like you said to procreate it well, so you can do that now. I can a, right a, now. If I couldn't have a baby, I could get in. The, I could get go to a fraternity clinic, and I could get a, a surrogate mother. Automatically, yeah. And and, and pay and a woman no to raise my kid for me, and I could have a baby. So uh, right. we already have that. We already have rentable uh, incubators right now that have mm -hmm. no say or anything. Well, especially if it's your egg and your your partner's sperm or whatever, and you make make the embryo and then you grow it that way, then it's still going to DNA wise, it's going to be yours. But if you get a donor egg or donor sperm, then even mm -hmm. if you have another person that has it for you, because you're not able to carry to full term, uh, you, you, you could uh, have a baby, but the, the DNA wouldn't prove that. And that's one of the documentaries that I think was really, really cool. I watched a couple of years ago about chimeras. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a twin that absorbs the other twin in the womb. And then sure. the mother, she wasn't married and she had given birth to her baby. And then it was a few weeks later, the baby came back for some tests or whatever they did. And they said, this isn't your kid. And she's like, what do you mean? He goes, well, we did the DNA and you're like an aunt or wow. something. You're not the mother. And she's like, I am right, the mother. The actual mother so right. She had to go to court and everything to prove that she was the mother that, you know, who was there when she gave birth and all that. And then her second kid, the same thing happened because certain parts of her body were her sister's DNA that she had absorbed because she was a chimera. So, it, you know, it's science is just freaking awesome. And I just it is awesome, but it's also yeah, it. science is awesome, but it's also very controversial. Um, well, yeah. because when it comes to certain surrogate mothers, you know, they're carrying the, they're carrying your baby. Okay. They, they, they've got your, they got your sperm, they've got your, uh, uh egg. And so they're carrying your child that's going to come. But some mm -hmm. of those surrogate mothers actually have their own DNA bond with the baby inside. So, uh, when they give birth to the child, most, some of, most of them are not ready to give up the child immediately. And they're saying, well, I know. That's, that's mine, why. You know? That's why it's really hard because you have a lot of people that don't want to do it afterward. That's why you want to make sure that you go through the right. Uh, if you do want to do something like that, you got to go through a, a right, the right type of agency to make sure that all the legal stuff is taken care of so that if something does happen, because how can you not, you know, I know I couldn't do it. I, I personally, I couldn't carry a baby, even if I'm not the one who, who created the baby. Uh, right. in my and body you would still have an attachment. That's the thing away. though, Janet. Yeah. You would have an attachment to that child. That's what I'm saying. That's how you would yeah, have so, an attachment. Yeah. Even if it's is, that's yeah. why they think that growing children in laboratories, you know, in these little incubators and things like that, like to mm -hmm. uh um, you know, not really cloning because it's really an embryo that you took from two people, you know, Correct. a man and a woman. Yeah but growing it in a bag like they did the, the sheep <laughs> and they've done other animals that way too. So it's, uh, but it sounds, I but it sounds, sounds so matrix to me. You remember all yeah, those children? Yeah, yeah, it is matrixy, but it is a future right. and they're doing it in uh, like Switzerland and stuff where they're taking uh, the DNA and they're oh, yeah. going through it, making changes so that the child mm. will have blue eyes or blonde hair or green mm. eyes. 
So, yeah, you know, or what, sex, yeah. what sex you want your child, they can already do all of that in laboratories. So. Oh, I, t I totally agree. And I was going to say, you have a cosplay. Uh, is it of Amazon women that you guys were talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's me. I was supposed. To, I was trying to dress up like the uh, some of the pictures I saw the Amazon Queen, but I didn't realize that that the Amazon Women on the Moon was just a segment. You know, basically in little pieces throughout the whole I movie. Would say, I'd never uh, seen can it. I give you? Yeah, can I give you an honest assessment? I think you do come pretty close to Sybil Danning. As yeah. Queen Laura. Oh, seriously, that's oh, really good. the actress. Yeah, the yeah. actress oh, Sybil Danning. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm man. saying. Yeah, absolutely. And you got the hair, the hair, right? Because if you've seen a picture of her, Sybil Danning, and the way she was as Queen Lauren, you see her hair is blonde and all that stuff. No, she had I had that. another wig that was more styled like hers, but it wasn't light like enough. Like blonde, yeah, uh huh, yeah, yeah, for that style. Yeah, well, I've I've got over yeah. forty wigs, so well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wouldn't have known it's a wig, Janet. You sell it so well. It's it's thank beautiful. You. Yeah, you're you're definitely Queen Laura, I would say. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, when I play on Saturday, uh play D D or whatever, what do you call it? Uh it's not uh, Dungeons for, and Dragons. For the, for the game we run, uh for, for the high level game, uh, that's Pathfinder for the uh oh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Now I remember her. Yeah, she's pretty. She had that yeah. um she had that. That Bob hairstyle Bob from like Knott's Landing and what was that other show? A TV show, Dynasty. Dynasty, yeah, Dynasty. Yeah. Dynasty. Yeah. yeah, she did. Uh -huh. She had that Dynasty hairstyle right there. But I was trying to do the one where she was wearing the little crown on her head. The little crown, okay. Uh, yeah, she's been in Playboy too. She was a Playboy model too. <laughs> no, <he didn't. laughs> yes, she was. Oh, okay. So I didn't know but like I, immediately, like I see her, you know, in the movie, and I'm like, uh, she's a Playboy model. Hello, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I, I always watched. Uh, I watch guys. I'm not really into watching the girls uh, on Playboy or anything. So she played Gretchen Krupp. <laughs> I've been the I have a beautiful life now, character. but way back when I was a little child, you know, every every little guy had his, you know, Playboy model, and you know, so. There were a few. Yeah, I just remember, uh, you know, lots of pinup posters. Yeah, you do. <laughs> magazines. So it was in the magazines, you could tear it out and hang it on your on your wall or in your locker at school. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wait, were you a David Cassidy girl? Mm -mm. No. Really? Who was who was your who was yours when you were growing up? I gotta think. Um, let's see. I liked. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. There was a few boys. That, most of them were cowboys and stuff. I oh, like. Uh, I liked Keanu. Uh, not Keanu. Um, what was this from Lost Boys? The. Uh, oh, Donald you like uh, Estevez Emilio? Well, no, I liked uh, the the two vampires. The, oh, she's talking I can't about what his name is. Uh, Sutherland. So, oh, Donald you like Sutherland's uh, son? Kiefer. He was Kiefer hot Sutherland. Okay. in that yeah. movie, and then the other one that played the other vampire that fell back on the bed with his earring and it kind of bounced when he fell back on the bed. Oh, he yeah, the dark haired one. Um, yeah, I can't um, remember what his name is, but he was cute. Uh, I don't know, I'd have to go through a bunch of them. There was quite a few that I thought were very attractive. Yeah, but I, I like guys like that wore blue jeans and wore yeah. like baseball caps. Or yeah, uh, cowboy hats, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Work boots. Okay. So it was Kiefer and. Because I wasn't Jason really into Patrick. one. Yeah, Michael. Jason Patrick. Michael, Jason Patrick, the dark hair. I didn't really I was, like. I was struggling with that guy's name. I couldn't think of Jason Patrick. Yeah, it was Jason uh, Patrick. Tom and then don't Cruise, forget the father of the empire. Tom Cruise because he was so short and stuff. I like taller well, guys. Well, Tom, wow. Cruise, Tom Cruise was in The Mummy and, you know, of course, the uh, reboot of the Mission Impossible franchise. Now, you are thinking of Jason Patrick. The my, He played Michael. He was the yep. guy who got converted. And, very, very yeah, and Kiefer was the, like, the second boss. And then don't forget but, the father was played by – the father vampire was played by – Edward Herman. I was like, whoa. Brad Pitt, he was very attractive when I saw him in Thelma and Louise. Oh, yes. I thought he was very sexy, but I don't really like blondes. I'm just not really, I don't just go looking for blonde guys. Most of the guys I like that I think are really good looking are, um, you know, brunette. 
you know, like uh, yeah. the guy that played um, uh, the van, uh, the werewolf in uh, True Blood series. He was married to yeah. uh, Susanna Varga. Yes, I heard True And he was the that. fireman stripper in Magic Mike. Uh, he's really attractive. I don't remember what his name is right now, but he's, you know, that kind of guy. Are you talking about Channing Tatum? Uh, he's okay. Yeah, it was in he, the other guy's way better looking to me than she. Yeah. Than, uh, uh, Fickner, William Fickner. No, Fickner. That's not it. no, really? not him. <laughs> but uh, there was a what's uh, her name, Susanna Varga or something that just got divorced. I'm not sure. She's very, very attractive, a Latino looking woman, very, very pretty. Hmm. Uh, Vega. I, don't know. I have to look her it last up. Last name was Vega, I but she was in the Spy Kids. So yeah, if you're thinking but, of her, she was in the Spy Kids franchise. That was Vega, her last name. I can't remember her first um, name. Alexa, that's it. Alexa Vega. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's not her. That's not. That's not her. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold yeah, on. See, now, when I grew up, yeah, when I grew up back in the early, I grew up in the seventies. You know, I I was I was born in sixty five, and I grew up in the seventies, and. One of the first shows I liked was Charlie's Angels. I was a, definitely a Charlie's Angels guy. But for me, the person that I liked the most was not Farrah Fawcett. I didn't like her at all. I, I thought she was kind of arrogant. The only one I really liked was Cheryl Ladd that played Chris Monroe. And she came in on the second season hmm. and stayed for the rest of it. You know, she was she was really good. I liked her. And she even she like she even signed a picture of her. It was her signature, and she sent it to me when I was just, you know, when I was young. And, uh, yeah, I had that poster for a while. <laughs> yeah, I had to sell it. I gave it to I gave it to someone good for, you know, for a good price. But uh, I think his but, name uh, is Joe Magalino. Okay. Mangianello. Mangianello. Yeah. The guy that played Flash. Mangianello. Oh, yes. he played. He was, his nickname was Big Dick or something like that in the movie um, Magic Mike. Right. Yeah. Magic Mike. He was okay. the fireman that picked up the girl and put her over his shoulder, and he was like, "Oh, he hurt his back or whatever." He was very attractive, but he was in True Blood, and when I saw him in True Blood, I was like, "Oh man, he's good looking." Janet, so. there's a chance. There, there, there is a chance for you. He's getting divorced. <laughs> if he's, he's ever at a con, I'm definitely gonna go. <laughs> so uh, I'll get tickets. Have you or, ever uh, seen the uh, and, uh, be a character or something? Because I want to, I'd love to meet him in person. Yeah. Have you ever seen the actor? Um, he was in Almost Human, and he was also in a couple of other movies. Uh, Sam Witwer. He's really a nice, good actor, and I liked him in Almost Human. But I'm not the really one where he plays I'm like really he plays like a vampire. He's on Sci-Fi. He plays a vampire. Then there's a guy who plays uh, like he's a werewolf, and then there's like a gal. In the in the apartment, that's a ghost. <laughs> so you have a ghost, a werewolf, and a vampire all living together in the same will in the same apartment. No, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't seen that. Yeah, Sam Witwer. He's a uh, he's very good. Yeah, I liked him in that. So, yeah, and he's done some other things. Um, any action stars stand out to you, Hunt? Any of the action stars that are still around? Um, Anyone that you like? I like. Uh... Just saw. Uh, I don't remember what their names are. I'm really bad with names. I see their face, but I I can't remember people's names. I have if to you say. Tell me the movie. I, if you tell me the movie, I could um, probably tell he, you. One favorite. of the guys that I really liked was the guy that was in um, the Thor movies, but he was the gatekeeper guy. Oh yeah, was that was great by Idris Elba. Yeah. Yeah, I love yes. him. I think he's a really good uh, action type uh, actor. Yeah. And then I love nice. all the John Wick movies. Oh, I, we have all the John Wick movies. We no, finally got all four. Yeah. Um, I was like, whoa, Keanu. Yeah. Totally awesome. I like those. I mean, it just depends. There's just a lot of different actors that I like. And I like them in one movie, but then I don't like them in a, in something else. I mean, I'm just really. One of the best, yeah, one of the best movies he had uh, that Keanu went against was Mark Dacascos. And that was in the third one. Mark Dacascos is, is like a great action star. You know, he's got he's got like a bald head now, but uh, you know, uh, Keanu went against him in the third John Wick, and I was like, "Whoa, uh, that was one of the best fight scenes I ever had." They were in a gallery, you know, which was part of the Continental. And it was just a new wing that they had just built mm -hmm. in, you know, that uh, you know the his friend Winston had built, um, 
and his assistant, uh, Winston's assistant, played by Lance Reddick, he passed away, rest in peace, but he was a great guy, too. He was a very good actor. He was the concierge, you know, for, like, all four films. Um, but, uh, yeah, in the fight against Mark DeCoscos, it was him and two uh, of his uh, ninja guys, and they're fighting in this, yeah, there he is, and they were fighting in this uh, top floor, which was just built into a gallery. There's all this glass and everything that's going on. And, uh, you know, first Wick has, you know, John has to kill his uh, assistants, and then he's got to go out to Mark. And yeah, Mark I like him. Yeah, I think he's a very attractive uh, guy, too. But I like uh, Jeffrey, is Jeffrey Dean Morgan, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I like him. him. I think he's uh, really attractive. I would love to meet him in person, but I think he's married. Um, so, you know, I just try to not, you know, make make a point to meet certain people because, you know, there, you, you never know anymore with so many people in so many different movies or anything or in, uh, you know, bands or whatever, whether they're dating or, you know, in movies and stuff like that. And I, you know, if right. I was going to meet them, interested in them or whatever to meet them in that way, I would want to know more about them. You know what I mean? Before I put myself in that. Yeah. Did you Sean, Patrick, Sean Patrick Flannery is way up on the my list. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you get to watch him when he did Young Indiana so Jones? Yeah. Did you get to watch him when he did that Young Indiana Jones Chronicles back in mm -hmm. the 90s? Yeah. Are you old enough for that, hun? <laughs> Do you remember those? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I knew him from he was good back then for that. Yeah. Oh, you know what he was great in though? He was great Boondock in Boondock Saints. Saints. Yeah, Boondock that's, Saints. that's yeah. where I met that's where I first saw him. Oh my god. Yeah, I like Wow, him. you and I yeah. have great memories. We reviewed yeah, that. We reviewed Saints. that one. You did? So. Oh, cool. What'd you think? Really good? I loved it. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Not that's so much great. the sequel. The first one was great, but Boom, but Boondock Saints, the second one, oh, which I, I think was called St. Patrick's good. Day. Yeah, I that was okay. Good. So, yeah, but yeah that good. was all right. Um, have do you uh, do you like did you like the uh, uh, the latest Dan, uh, Daniel Craig when he played Bond, the latest Bond when he played that for those five movies? Mm -hmm. Did you like no. Jan, Daniel Craig? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Oh, okay. I don't well, really like his. <laughs> I don't think okay. he's that attractive, and I don't really like uh, his work. I mean, it's uh, not. He, not at he my did get in deliverance. I don't. Yeah, I you don't know. Wouldn't turn to go directly toward that person when there's someone else over there might be a little more appealing. So. This yeah. movie is a movie that will surprise Janet because this has got your Mark Duroskos. It's got Samuel Le Bion, Vincent Cassel, Emily the Queen. It's a French action film released. I love a year foreign after. movies. <laughs> this is a year after this the Matrix werewolf came movie. Out. Yeah, this is not a werewolf movie. This oh. is a movie about a cult that is trying to assert France. And holy shit, if it's not one of the best fucking. Oh porn man, movies I've yeah. Ever seen. I've seen this trailer. It's really good. This is a movie I definitely would want to see. Yeah, All when right. did that come out, Bruce? Love this stuff. 2003, 2000, no, 2001. My bad. I saw it. Yeah, I haven't seen it. They, I want to see it. I would love to watch this. this. They they aired this at the Amazon Theater in 2003. We'd never heard of it. We'd never seen anybody in it. And at the time, like this movie kind of blew my mind because it took the the cinematography styles of The Matrix. And I think Winlow Ping is the guy that does the cinematography for the I love fight. the costumes. You know it's, how I like this era. <laughs> I'm so surprised in this trailer they get away with Dan here boob shot. They they get away with the boob shot in this this trailer here. It is so good. Yeah. But this movie, it kind of and I love martial it, arts. This movie gave me a lot of hope for what future films could be. And if we would have stayed on that timeline, we could have had amazing films. But instead, like we got shitty comic book movies. And yeah. I, I, I threw well, too much money at that. The sad thing is, Bruce, honestly, so many, we lost so many theaters already because of the, the COVID shutting them down, basically. And during that yeah. time, we had such a lapse in any good scripts coming out or people scrambling to get the scripts and make them good to make blockbusters because there's no place to play them now. 
And it's yeah, really it's hard for them to make yeah. bank when you can have 30 people sitting in your living room watching something that they're only getting paid for one viewer. See? So it, it changes a lot. They had control when people would go in to a real theater and sit and watch a movie and have popcorn and everything. Uh, I love doing that. That's my favorite way to watch a movie to me. Uh, I enjoy it. I went and saw Ghostbusters, the new, the, the new Ghostbusters. That the Empire. Yeah, yeah, my wife and I really saw it. We have, we have a specific without that, <laughs> without that aspect of collecting the money, uh, we're just not going to see any more huge blockbusters anymore. It's all going to yeah. be like what you've seen with Yellowstone and things like that. It's going to be streaming services. Then the uh, once it like Pinky Blinders, things like that. It's once it's played on the thing where you're paying subscription for it, and that they still can't control how many people you have in your house. Now, if they found out that you were selling five dollars a seat to come into your house and watch something, you could probably get in trouble. But it's just too hard for them to control all the houses that have it. So the subscription service is just isn't going to put out the same uh, quality of movies. That's why I'm loving the fact I still love European movies because they still have so much um taste left like this movie that you were just talking about they put so much detail and everything into the depth into the characters and the movies here it's like uh they, they can make any dribble and people just eat it up because they're starving for uh entertainment you know even gaming and all that is all gone downhill yes since the, uh, I, I agree pandemic. there's only well let me ask you a question janet when do you think for sure that the kind of theaters that still you know, there's there's the ones that we go to here in Canada called Cineplex mm -hmm. Odeon, and uh, they have what they call D box, which you know makes you totally immersive into the film. Mm -hmm. uh, then you Is have with the, are you talking about the ones where they put the smells in the air and they spray. Yes, them they have a smell. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, you'll yes. have you'll have larger like you'll have your main screen in front of you, but along mm -hmm. the sides of the theater, kind of along your peripheral. You're going to have extra screens. They'll have scents come out. They'll have the seats vibrate. You'll yes. have uh, the periphery. You'll have all this stuff happen. Mm -hmm. It's a 4D experience. And they yeah, have the 4D theaters, theaters, theaters too. Yeah. Like so, yes. And I love yeah, that. I've been to a couple. I love it. I think it's great. Now, see, that's what I'm saying. They have to go to those lengths to have a theater to get people to go to the theaters. Now it's getting to where even the good theaters that I used to go to are now um, they're, they're only doing like old movies and TV shows and stuff like that. Now, just to try to even keep afloat because they've lost so much business that, that that's basically the only way they're even able to stay going right now is because right. people are now not you've, watching. You've worked in the industry. I know that Janet. So let me ask you this um, mm -hmm. absolute question. When, in your honest opinion, do you think that theaters will just no longer be able to accommodate uh, either because the theaters are near empty and the prices are way too expensive? Because I know D-Box alone is like $25 a person. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do that. We do a, a step up below that, but you still get, you know, all the surround sound and everything. But you're mm -hmm. still paying over, you know, $20, $25 for a couple. So when do you think all of that's just going to go by the wayside? You know, when well, the it's already going. Started. It's already happening right now. Uh, yeah. I've gone to a, different places that diff on my travels to Texas, Oklahoma, uh, yeah. Louisiana, and Arkansas. And you go to some old theaters that I went to, like you know, 17, 18 years ago, and they're musty. Right. the The seats are ripping. Uh, the floor is uneven. The carpets, you know, you, you can just tell. The the screen's got little holes in it, things like that. They're slowly deteriorating, and they can't afford to repair all the stuff because they don't make the money anymore. And a lot of them are like five dollar movies, you know, and they're showing reruns and things like that. It, it it's already happening. You know, it, they're going. The movie theaters are going to soon be what you used to have when uh, your your parents went to the drive-ins. That's what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, which is there's only yeah, one drive that, that I know of. Yeah, there's only one drive in that I remember. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, I used to live in Arizona for a long time. And there was a place down there in Scottsdale called the Scottsdale Six. And it was a drive in. Like it was right out in the middle of the desert there, uh, just outside of town. And it was still around when, when my, uh, when Suzanne and I moved back here to Canada. So 
I think it's still there, but there's 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 very few places left that have anything in the way of a drive-in. And there's yeah. also theaters that have IMAX. They used to have IMAX everywhere. There's not mm -hmm. very many left. I think there's like one mall. Because you got to remember, there, it's expensive. Mall that has it. Yeah, it's expensive for the company that makes the movie to make it 3D or uh, IMAX or any of these special movies like the one you were talking about, the immersive one. To actually yeah. film that, you have to film it with you know different sound and all different things. So it's right. more expensive, and uh, they're just going to do it. When why would they spend all that money to do that when they can make it to where you can stream it on your TV? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. But then some of us, well, that's to. the thing. We don't, there's, there's very, um, we kind of consider ourselves low income. So we don't really have like a lot of the streaming services they ask you to pay for, like Netflix, Paramount Plus, things like that. Um, I just remember that before we left, we, we were still able to watch, you know, something on cable, but now even that's gone by the wayside. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sad. I, I, I think it's yeah. really sad. It, it is. And that's why um, ever since I was a kid, I, I went to Comic-Con whenever I could. Oh, afford it. Comic -Con. I, can I, can I, I go to Comic-Con. The last one I got to go to, I got to meet William Shatner and Christopher Lloyd and was dressed as an Andorian. I had a blast. I had tons of people take their picture with me. Uh, it's immersive. Okay. And I can dress up in any costume. And guess what? I fit right in. There and you go. what better place to go? <laughs> You know, what better place for a grown up that can be Halloween anytime, basically, and 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 hang out with all the people there, all love what you're what you love. So you fit right, right in. It's a it's a, it's a new thing. And I see that type of thing growing because they do they do do shows there. They have different rooms you can go in depending on what tickets you buy. And you can learn how they made this series or that or what this cartoonist and this uh, writer did to make this series of comic books. You can learn so much stuff about all the different genres that you're interested in, depending on what con you go to. Because you can go to horror cons or you can go to sci-fi cons or you can go to comic con. You know, it, it's whatever you decide to do. And uh, that's basically the kind of stuff that I do now is I do a lot of promo work where, you know, I'd sell like... Uh, uh, phone cards or uh, vape, you know, vape, different vape bottles or little bottles yeah. of vodka, you know, I'll pass out di different bottles of vodka, things like that, depending, but because, you know, it's, I had to start doing all that type of stuff because when they said you had to have the jab to be able to work in commercials or movie music videos or anything, uh, I just started doing promo work because I didn't have to have that. Yeah. So, so is it, it pretty really lucrative? Is it pretty no, lucrative? Not really. It's a, it's it's a lot of work. You know, you have to do a lot yeah. of work, a lot of driving, uh, and uh, you don't make as much money because mm -hmm. you, you got to go to a different place. If you get one that's a two week gig, that's really good. But when you get to move on a get to do work on a movie, especially as a stand in or something like that, you could work for two or three weeks. That's a really good chunk of money. Which is, which is pretty good money. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm yeah, guessing one movie. You know, then yeah, sorry, you go ahead. find another one and you got to find another one or a TV show or you got to find commercials. You got it, It's a constant thing. And if you have an agent, it even costs you even more money. So a lot of the uh, actors that weren't you know, like famous, you know, huge ones that can make $10 million a movie and things like that. Uh, those ones are having to do other stuff. They're having to write books or they're having to, uh, you know, like me, I make art. I, I do a lot of things. I multitask basically. Uh, and I make, you know, I make costumes. I sew t-shirt bags. I make bags out of old t-shirts. I do a lot of things. And because when I lived in New Orleans, I was able to just go down to quarter and, and, uh, mingle and, uh, you know, sell my wares down there. And it, it's totally set up differently because you have a huge tourist industry, but that's even taken a hit. Any city that used to use tourists uh, to make your living, uh, it's it's hurting because people don't have the money to go on these trips anymore. Yeah, it's, so yeah, it's not only that, but but the pandemic too. Yeah, everyone because, in Hollywood is not uh, a bunch of stuck up liberal nutcases that think that everybody should be jabbed up and uh, zombies and do what they're told or whatever. Uh, most of the people that I met working and stuff were people that just wanted to be free, they had, be able to keep their money, live where they wanted, uh, marry who they wanted, and have everybody, the government stay out of their lives. That's it. And that's how I am. You know, I'm one of those people. But, you know, I was born in Newfoundland. So uh, I was born yeah, in Canada. Yeah. Like, oh, my no, dad was, 
Airports. Yeah. My dad was Where Airports. Where my wife is from. Yeah. So, She's from um, there too. And uh, that was one of the things I was going to say about the big outdoor screens. The very first time I ever got to go to something like that was when I was a little girl. We were in the Philippines. Aww. My dad was stationed there. And it, yeah. they called it the happening on the green. And it was a huge like football field. You know, grass, nice. beautiful, and it had a huge screen, like a drive-in theater, but it was no cars. It was people just with blankets and chairs and stuff, and we'd go out and watch movies that way on the weekend. So, And that was that outside was of Manila, right? Yeah, that was outside yeah. of Manila. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was nice. It was it was be beautiful. And But the thing is, not every state can do that. You can't do that in, like, uh, <laughs> Idaho. You well, know, yeah, you can't even do that well. in Arizona anymore. We used to yeah, have we so. used to have displays like that. We had a place called Paradise Valley Park. We we had polo field there. We had guys and gals who were playing polo on horses, and that's not there anymore. I mean, that was that well, was such you know, a new you have thing. To be was able to pay your thing. taxes for your property. You have to be able to pay yeah. your insurance because you have all these people coming and going on your property. If they fall and hurt themselves, they could sue you. They're so liable. You pay all those people. You got to have a lawyer basically on call at any time for anything that could happen. Then you have to pay all the taxes for all the different things you're involved in. If you sell merchandise and if you have food, you have to have a license for that. I mean, if you sell liquors, you have to have a license for that. See, it's gotten so expensive to have yeah. any type of business, depending on what state you live in. You know, right. if you're in a good state that's friendly to, uh, you know, entrepreneurs then you'll you'll be able to have a business and probably make a really good living but like me i i'm a uh independent contractor because i'm my product you know i i have to work to be able to make money but and sell myself and not you know not like a prostitute or anything like that <laughs> i have to, get, <laughs> no, I I have to pretend to want me over that other person because there's a million people that want to do the same thing and yeah. either they like my voice because I can be, you know, I can be a bitch. I can act like a bitch, dress like a bitch, look like a witch, uh, <laughs> you know, dress, wear wigs, whatever it is that it takes. But it's hard and it's a lot of work to to um, to uh, be able to fit whatever it is that you're trying to put yourself into. And plus, I've done voiceovers, so I have to. Yeah, I yeah, assume you did voiceovers. Yes, I do course. all kinds of stuff like that. But it's hard and far in between to fill in the gaps when uh, the economy is so bad. And that's why I really hope to God that people will start fighting for their country so we can get our country back to where we can keep the money that we, we earned. Yeah, we need to get it back to what we yeah. were you know, meant to do back in the early 70s and 80s is we had our own funds. We, we could do whatever we wanted with it. We didn't really have to worry about restrictions. That's what was so nice. You know, my parents that were able to afford a nice house to raise four kids, uh, you know, and then be able to live comfortably after that, you know, and it just, I wish we could all go back to that because that would be nice. I mean, well, there's no going you know, back. We can only go forward and, uh, yeah. you know, work yeah. on what we have. To send your money to American, uh, American <laughs> interests and not send your money over to George Soros's bastard son, uh, little, little Zelensky. Little Zelensky <laughs> needs your help in, uh, in the Ukraine. And it's amazing how much money he goes through. Uh, Zelensky, he's, he's a very good man. He tries. He used to be a boxer. Don't you people like athletics? He was a boxer. I don't understand why right? people don't want to give more money to uh, Ukraine. I know that you don't have money for electricity or fuel or, you know, heaven forbid, your winter's coming. Ha, 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 ha. You're going to freeze to death in your homes. But no, give your money to the Zelensky. Yes, that's exactly what America deserves, is to have all their money embezzled by the Biden family. Fuck, fuck America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. the entire fucking uh, left right now. Fuck those people. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Um, let me ask you a question, Janet. I've always, because I consider you absolutely a celebrity. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm far from one. I'm just the person that gets to do something that's fun, and I wish everybody have a chance to do a job well, they like. I think you to work so, as an actor. I worked on a few, it. you know, a TV series and a movie. So, you know, I feel like I had my 15 minutes of being back in the day. Uh, what, who was the, who was your favorite actress that you got to stand in for? Uh, that you got to do um, a picture? Yeah. Got to stand in for? Well, I don't yeah. really want to say because really? I don't want people looking me up. Yeah. Mm -mm. Oh, like, oh, yeah. okay. Um, well, then what was like the best thing you got to do a voiceover for? What was the best show or? Well, it hasn't movie? been made yet. I, I oh. sent it in 
but the video hasn't come out yet. And it's a YouTuber. Okay, okay, secret, secret. Okay. Yeah, it's a YouTuber, <laughs> I did a voiceover for, and I'm still waiting for their special uh, little thing when it comes out. That's and, my third one because it was the funnest one I've gotten to do. Other ones yeah. are pretty boring. Like I've done a computer voice. I've done uh, a mother on the phone. You know, I've done all, and I did. I did one uh, kitten ball. Have you ever watched the kitten ball on Animal Planet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The puppy ball, and then they had the kitten halftime show. So and that was you. Oh, I've, I've done the you. kitty the kitty halftime show. Yeah, yeah I've I done remember. lots of different things. But um, oh, the thing is, you, you got to do what you can when you when you get the opportunity to do it. You know what I mean? And if 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 something comes across your table and you're thinking about it too hard, you're gonna miss out on something. Because if you do it and you don't like, it, you just don't do it again. That's how I tell. Right. That's why people try it once just to see whether or not it's something you might be interested in. Oh, never yeah, know. I've done it once uh, already. I, um, yeah, I have a gentleman that uh, is our friends in our community. His name is uh, Jim's Landscape LLC Number One Commodore Productions on YouTube. He's on YouTube, and he does fan films. And, uh, you know, it's mostly Star Trek fan films and things like that. I got to do a computer voice for the first time. And my sh and, and my fan film with my voice on it is coming out next month. It's well, called Repair 4. It was yeah, fun, wasn't it? See, it's it also was a memory. Yes. It's also a memory you'll always have. So even if it's not really big hit or anything, it's something you got to do. I have I have scrapbooks. I scrap every, scrapbooked everything I've done, every single yeah. thing. And uh, I've got it in scrapbooks so that, you know, my family have that if they're ever interested in looking at it, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I have, I have a pretty good memory because I, I, I was working as an extra with a good friend of mine. His name is Larry Bartels. Uh, he's been in Near Dark. He's been in a few other films, too. Yeah. Uh, he got to work with Bill Paxton in Near Dark. I was so jealous that I wanted to work with that guy. Um, but I did get to work with uh, Billy Blanks and uh, a guy named Ken Scott in the... Uh, it was, it, was, it was called Showdown. It was filmed in the Phoenix, Arizona area. They used my old high school, uh, Paradise Valley, as one of the places that they had the kids in and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I met, uh, uh, what's well, her last name is Donna. She was in a film that she did with uh, Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Uh, so I got to meet her. Um, I also got to meet uh, another Ken. He was a stuntman that was uh, working. And, um, you know, and we were sitting there, uh, we were in this dojo that, well, it was an old warehouse down in, in outside of Phoenix that they transformed into a dojo. So like a, a fight club of sorts. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm the, I'm in the audience there and you can actually, <laughs> they took my voice. This is so embarrassing. They took my voice and replaced it with some other voice another voiceover actor so there's a part of me where i'm standing there and i'm in my jacket and i go yeah like this you know like take it down yeah something like that and some guy took over and took my voice out of there and <laughs> put somebody else in. <laughs> well you know that you definitely thought it was me though you know if you look at the face here just think about 20 years younger you know or 30 30 30 years younger because that's when the movie came out was 1994 so you just mm -hmm. have to look at that, see me 30 years younger. And uh, yeah, and you'll definitely point, you'll pick me out. I'm I'm in crowd scenes. I'm just walking around doing stuff. Uh, seven years before that, I was on television. It's an experience that you're going to remember forever, right? Yeah, absolutely. So aren't you glad you got to try it? I did. I had my 15 minutes of fame. But that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I tell everybody. And the cool thing is like uh, in New Orleans, it, you know, we call it the Hollywood South, basically. So, yeah. and then a lot of my friends were in, you know, in The Walking Dead and stuff because it was a state away. So, oh, you know, a lot of people went back and forth, back and forth, and did work in both, you know, states and things like that. So, it just depends because they do film a lot in lots of different states, you know. Uh, and if your state is uh, smart and they work it out to where your taxes are low enough to draw in that kind of industry. Yeah, you yeah. know, it can help a lot of different towns because they're looking for certain sets, you know, and if you have tons of roads and you, stuff like that, they're not going to film a movie like uh, our TV series like Yellowstone there. Oh, they want, you know, they want it to look like it's rural or older, you know, from the, you know, 
1600s, 1700s, 1800s, depending on uh, what they need for the scenery. And that's what location yeah. managers do is they run around looking, find places to film. Yeah. So, okay. so basically right now, if I'm correct, you did say Louisiana. I know my wife's been to the French Quarter. She's been to New Orleans, so she really enjoyed it. She went for Mardi Gras one time. Yeah. I, um, I can't say that I've been blessed yet to be there, but I would love to go there myself. Uh, even if it's you not Mardi Gras, I would love to see the French go Quarter. To, go to a um, a jazz festival if you like jazz. Jazz music. festival. I love jazz. I love jazz. I love all kinds of music. You I'm should a, you I'm and a music your wife go and uh, enjoy yourselves because uh, it would yeah. help the economy and you could probably get some really good deals because, you know, they're hurting. So I can that's what I tell people. I tell people to try to take your vacation the right. in the States. You know, yeah. don't take your money and spend it going to another country. Try to find a state, something you haven't done. You know, like right. uh, we used to go to like, I take my mom to Mount Rushmore uh, we took her to Grand Aww. Canyon. Uh, yeah, we, I took my wife to Grand Canyon. She's that we you know, have born in Canada here, and I took her to Canyon. Yes, that yes. is uh, going to help the economy, you know, because you're going to be, and you get to spend time together when you're driving, you know, in your vehicle, do the car yeah. games, you know, with the colored cars or, or trucks or, you know, different we things like that. We had a dye yeah, we had a dive cast red Nissan Rogue. So when I brought my my uh, wife to visit my parents back in Arizona, we drove across the country. We left from Buffalo, New York, after we crossed the border. And I drove her all the way across, all the way down to Arizona. And then when we moved back here to Canada, because uh, she lives, we live in Toronto area now. So when I drove her back, we went all the way up through California, uh, Idaho, um, you know, Washington state and we got, we crossed the border in Idaho and went all the way across Canada. And in Manitoba, she actually ran into some people she knew, well, not know, but people that, uh, yeah. she knew were from Newfoundlanders. Yeah. From Newfoundland. And like I said, she was born in St. John's Newfoundland. Yeah. I'm so planning on that. I'm saving it. my money because I'm wanting to go to Newfoundland, uh, this year. And I want to go to, uh, see, uh, wow. the, um, Niagara Falls, you know. You haven't been to Niagara Falls yet? We've been there three times. Oh, you're going to love it, Baronet. And I have relatives in Norway that keep begging me to come. You got to go. You have to go. So I'm trying to save money so I can take some of these trips that I haven't been procrastinating about taking, but that's the things I want to do. I'll tell you two attractions. Yeah, three attractions you can check out in Niagara Falls. If you want me to say them, I can tell you. I can tell you okay. what you Okay. Well, you can, well, um, I was going to say, if you want, you can send me some on um, information about Niagara Falls and stuff on X, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Are, are you on X the same mm -hmm. way, Janet, from another planet? Mm -hmm. Same way? Okay, cool. Yeah. Ours is at four Sues, F O U R S U Z E. I can send you information about Niagara Falls. Um, but three of the attractions I can tell you right away is. Uh, the Hornblower Cruise, that's the boats that go right as close as, as possible to American Falls, Niagara Falls, uh, the Bridal Falls, all of them. And, I mean, you just it brings you right there. The mist and everything, beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the other one I would recommend is going to Clifton Hill. There is a beautiful 4K theater there that you can go there and watch 4K films. The full immersive, sir, uh, full immersive experience, uh, mm -hmm. everything, it's, it's affordable. Uh, it's just awesome like you know tim hortons is there everything is there um there's also a place called the nightmares fear factory and if you really like horror i mean this is built on an old abandoned coffin factory site now they got the you know they got the actors and actresses you know foot people hand people and stuff they're gonna grab at you things like that but there is an actual spirit that still inhabits the coffin factory his name is abraham and he used to be the owner he used to create and build coffins for deceased people and these kids these rowdy kids one time uh accidentally uh were messing around in his factory and a whole bunch of coffins fell on top of him that's the legend oh. and then when they tried to find his body his body was gone they unburied it he wasn't even in his coffin he wasn't there well they couldn't so. have uh couldn't make 
much uh, money if they had a business that was on haunted stories if they didn't have a haunted story. <laughs> well, so, yeah, that, that's an actual they, haunted factory. I mean, a lot, a real down, spirit uh, there. Yeah, not just actors and stuff. You know, it's down in cool. New Orleans for the voodoo tours and the uh, you know the haunted cemetery tours and stuff. They have all these really uh, in, intricate little uh, you know, stories they tell you about certain people who died or they lost their hands and that, you know, right. just different things going on. But um, Bruce, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, discuss about the yeah, movie? Uh, th we... there's, a, there's a part of this film. Mm -hmm. Let me present this to you. Uh, part of this movie is really cool. <laughs> yes. the, uh, video pirates. These guys yeah. are sailing along. They, they're they're uh, their flag, and they're going for the MCA ship, and this scene happens right here, and that fucking injury, I can't find anything on on this, but this part of the film kind of makes me wonder, like, did somebody get injured here? Because look at this. They, that, yeah. That, yeah, that yeah. looks like a fucking impact. Like, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but that looks really painful. Yeah, it did look like you can get in the ass. You got yeah, that's a ass. concussion. One of the stuntmen, if I recall about reading about the uh, movie, one of the stuntmen there that got hit by that thing literally did. Like he was okay. knocked out, completely knocked out. I couldn't out. find anything about injuries or production. Uh, usually, yeah, I can, uh, I can actually look it up. Yeah, sure. Wikipedia um, usually does a great job with production notes and all i get is amazon moon on the moon moon was filmed in 1985 with plans for an august 1986 release but due to the ongoing legal fallout from the twilight zone accident which had director john landis at the center of mm -hmm. universal repeatedly pushed the release date and issued a gap order on publicity for the film while the trial was ongoing that's the only production notes i was able to really find um that that accident if you're saying concussion, okay, I can I can see that. I can completely understand that, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's one of my uh, more favorite parts of this entire uh, movie. Cause Why? Because someone got hurt? <laughs> no, because that set looked so oh, good. Yeah. It yeah. reminds me of a hearing that. Film. that one and the funeral uh, service for the um, you know with the. Uh, Fake, uh, whatever it's called, where they they fried that guy or whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, the, the roast. Yeah, the roast. Uh, those two scenes uh, for the parts in the movie to me are the two I feel that they spent the most money on. I, I feel sorry yeah. for Archie Han. He's uh, he he was the guy that was died and gets roasted. The yeah. maker in that. <laughs> yeah, the but I think they did that on purpose because he looked uh, very very overdone. You know. Yeah. For a dead person, like they over dramatically did his makeup, and then the the one part when he says he's got to put his two cents worth in after he, I guess he could take it from his eyes or something like that, like they put a penny on each eye or something. It was some really corny uh, little uh, stabs, but I just thought it was great. I I laughed through the whole thing. I thought it was really good. But the last guy, the black gentleman, was to me I thought was the best out of all joke wise. Rip Torn, I've gotten to see him before. Uh, I went with my mom. I don't remember uh, where it was at. It wasn't it's it wasn't in Vegas or it was at like some uh, like maybe uh, what's the name of that place? Not Six Flags. Uh, I can't remember. Universal the, Studios. No, it was a little one here in Arkansas. Uh, had Uncle Abner, Uncle Abner, and uh, all those characters. Oh, God, I cannot remember. I'm so terrible at that. All right. Um, yeah, there is something I found here, Bruce. And if you allow me, I'll go ahead and read it to you. Uh, this comes from the IMDb database. It says the film within the film, Amazon Women on the Moon, is constantly interrupted by commercials and assorted yeah. problems, which include a burning print of the film. Pieces mm -hmm. of the movie missing, which includes the opening credits, and the unseen death of astronaut Blackie, who was killed trying to steal the sacred moonstones, and the love scene between Sybil Danning and Steve Forrest. Now, this is pretty much like an old drive-in movie, which was sent around the country, and the print would be missing reels 
due to censorship issues or basically some scenes were so racy that they were memorable and worth keeping for private use by by projectionist yeah uh, i like uh, the other part i really enjoyed was the uh first lady of the evening which i found to be hilarious because i could completely see that with like some twat like nurse fucking or excuse me dr <laughs> jill biden after she sedates her husband and puts him to bed, she goes out with like John Effing Carey and goes and fucks uh, John Carey for some Heinz money. And you know, that I can see that. I can absolutely see that because that's the type of morality that dumb cunt has. And fuck that slag and fuck that family. Both of them actually. Um, the other scene I really thought was funny was that you have Mark Adler and Kelly Preston as the young kids. Kelly Preston, she just died in 2020. She's the young girl wanting to get the Titan condoms put inside her uh, with, with a, a fully grown penis. And poor fucking Matt Adler, the kid plays George. By the way, all the names from the Titan Man segment are taken from It's a Wonderful Life. It's yep. Gower, Violet, George, mm -hmm. uh, Rupert King, played by Howard Hessman, the late, great Howard Hessman. And I thought that was good. The video date segment, I found it hilarious because you had Corrine Wall as Sherry, the big titty girl that wanted uh, Mark McClure Ray to go and seduce her, even though it's an interactive video before interactive videos. And Andrew fucking Dice Clay played her husband, who fucking deletes her. Yeah. Damn. And there was and there was the guy that was uh, you you remember Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad? Yes. He was in the film. He said yes. of all the films in his IMDb titles that he wanted removed, this, this was one. The one. This, this is, is it. This is the movie he wants to completely delete from. From the record, and I'm like, you fag, quit being a <laughs> schlup, Brian. And he's a schlup. I'm I'm sorry. He had he had one really big bad series, and everybody else loves it. I find it boring, but fuck, like I don't find Brian Cranston to be that good. I watched Godzilla 2014, and I thought, what a shit show. More more focus on human characters than the, the monsters. I want to see monsters, and thank God for Godzilla minus one. And Kong versus Godzilla is coming out, so great. Yeah, it looks um, good. Yeah, we want to go see that. Uh, my wife and I, we want to see the Godzilla versus Kong. Absolutely, that looks really good. Yeah, I definitely want to. I, go I see grew that. up with a lot of that. Did you ever grow up with those old time Godzilla movies like uh, Godzilla yeah, yeah. versus Mothra and uh, Godzilla versus? Yeah, uh, it was Megatron, always like a weekend matinee. It was like weekend yeah. matinees with double features with uh, oh, different movies like that. But uh, yeah, but I watched uh, reruns of uh, the original Star Trek with my dad. Yeah, that's what got me into. Uh, we watched. Yeah, we watched that. I watched that with my dad too. We would sit at the at the uh, his uh, seat, his uh, his own personal seat, right? Because dads always had a seat for themselves, mm -hmm. and I would sit between his, uh, you know, sit there either on his lap because I was still a young kid, you know, or I'd sit down in front of him. And we watch every single Star Trek episode, everything, all 79, everything. I was just, and then I started watching, you know, as I was getting old enough, I was starting to watch, you know, uh, Next Generation. So I'd watch every Next Generation episode, uh, you know, then DS9, then Voyager. And then uh, the last one I saw was Bacula, you know, Enterprise. And I saw all the episodes and all the se uh, seasons of uh, Enterprise. And I remember when they brought back, uh, Dean Stockwell, you know, the guy that played the AI in uh, Quantum Leap. And of course, he just recently passed away. So rest in peace, Dean. But uh, they did a they did an episode where they brought back Scott and Dean together because they did the show. Right. And uh, and that was a great episode. I just I love when they brought those two guys back together. So, yeah, that's that was good TV. I mean, and, uh, you know, it was UPN and, you know, and and night at Paramount, and that's when it was, you know, actually fun to watch. And then uh, everything went bad after that. <laughs> so yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, there, there's some really good stuff about the Star Trek uh, series that I, I like. And I didn't, I'm not a big fan of Next Generation. I'm not a big fan of Voyager. I'll watch them if they're on, but I'm not going to like go hunt them down on the web. Uh, DS9, all the original series, Enterprise. Those are like my favorite versions of Star Trek, uh, aside from Galaxy Quest. But I uh, the old Galaxy Quest, yeah, yeah that's good, really good. But yeah, I, I think that uh, Janet could stand in for Sigourney Weaver for sure. 
<laughs> he, would, he would outshine Sigourney Weaver, especially in that role. Uh, I love the Galaxy Quest. We did that, didn't we? Yep, we did. You guys uh, did it? Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. We did that review uh, a bit. Year. And uh, the, but uh, the one thing I thought was so cute and adorable that that uh, just little things like this is one of the this reasons why I like this movie was the fact that the scenes where they had the moon and the rocket and stuff mm -hmm. and you're watching they're watching out the window and when the when the moon explodes right you see yeah. the string holding the the rocket and the moon you know and then when it explodes you see the moon piece that's stuck. That's way so, back and forth. Yeah, just little stuff like that is what reminded yeah. me of the old nostalgia of those Right, old that's old right. That's what they said stuff. in the IMDb was those yeah. were they had that of the spaceship, the moon, the uh uh what was it, the sun, all this <laughs> other stuff. And it was all uh, in homage to 50s uh movies mm -hmm. that had cheesy effects, you know, back yeah. then. Like all the I mean, old Vincent Price movies and yes. uh, another famous uh guy that played Dracula Hunter all the time. Um, and what about and what about those fake uh those big huge oversized ants in them that was filmed in the Arizona desert out near Yuma? Uh, and that, everybody, Larry showed me where that was, was Yeah, was the rocket that they had. You know, the yes. before it took off, the big fake rocket. You could tell wasn't real. But when the <laughs> women were throwing the uh, giant uh, spears. Oh, yeah. that's my favorite. That's my favorite oh part my of the. Oh my god, that was so funny! I that, I couldn't stop laughing. It was so stupid and corny. Oh man, it's it, it reminded me of. Do you guys remember the old Johnny Quest? Yes. The very end of Johnny Quest, it shows you the rocket trying to get away and the Toho Warriors, Toho Devils, are throwing the spears. That is exactly what that reminds me of. And boy, those girls did not play field and track. That's yeah, you could tell. They, could, they were ducking their heads down and stuff, trying to throw it because they didn't know how. Yeah. So they didn't practice before. But what was <laughs> funny, too, it reminded me of the movie Caveman. You keep saying we're going to watch one day. You need Remember to see it. You guys need to see Caveman with Ringo Starr and Barbara Bach. That's yeah. that's and how those you met Barbara his stuff. wife. That's what it reminded me of. A scene, yeah. you know, because it's dorky and dumb. You know, the same dorkiness that I remember yeah. from that movie. So sure. Star Trek continues. We review yeah. Star Trek continues, and boy, if that show doesn't bring a tear to my eye. Oh, well, we episodes. had a we had a theory. Um, we had a theory, Bruce and, and Janet. Uh, we discussed this also in one of my previous streams. And, and it, well, actually, I discussed it, and a lot of people agreed with me. Um, I said that what if there was a way of proving you could take the first three episodes or the first three seasons of TOS, then you take the animated series and take parts of the animated series as making it like officially a, a fourth season, and then mm -hmm. you take every single episode from Star Trek Continues and there's season five. And that yeah. covers everything in the original series. Everything. From like the beginning all the way into the very end uh, when Monona's, you know, standing there and he says, we're done with our five-year mission after the his battle with the Espers, yeah. which, you know, started way back on No Man Has Gone Before with Gary Mitchell and, uh, you know, and Sally Kellerman playing, the you know, the female. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, it was complete. It came full circle. And that's what it was so great. And everybody said, yeah, absolutely. And even Gene Roddenberry's son, who's still around, he said, Star Trek Continues is canon. My dad would have loved to to add that to his uh, show. Yeah, when Bruce got me to watch it, or let we got to watch it, I, I the first one I was standing up and applauding because I just Yay. thought it was so good. The very first episode that I got to watch, I loved yeah. it. It was so campy and it was so... Um, it just made me feel like I was watching original Star Trek. I mean, I, even though I knew it wasn't, but it had the same feel to me. Yeah, there was that caveman episode that, that featured George Takei. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like, whoa, George. He went really, oh my gosh, he really went out for his role in that episode. And I was, you, you remember it, Janet? He was all in like hair and he was like a caveman and stuff, George Takei. Uh -uh. You remember him as Sulu, but then he's like all dressed up. Yeah, you have to. No, you I have to. That episode. I'll have to um go back and watch it. I'll, I'll probably remember yeah. once I start to watch it. Yeah, you got to yeah. for sure. And I'll tell you one thing for sure. I the one, the one person 
that kept the lineage going was Chris Dewin, uh, the son of James. When, you know, when James passed away, Chris said to uh, James Cauley first, and then he said, and then to Vic Monona, you know, and, and, and James and Vic were like kids that hung around the sets, you know, with, with their dads and, and mom and, you know, working and everything when they were little kids. And now they got to do this, you know, start, you know, phase two new voyages and then, uh, you know, continues. And mm -hmm. Chris Stewart said, hey, can I play my dad's role of Scotty? And he says, absolutely, because he like, he's like the dead reckoning image of his dad, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, Chris got to play that role of Scotty all through the uh, Star Trek Continues series, the fan films. So, yeah, I was so happy. Yeah, we I, I watched all the episodes. That, that's about as good as, as television has gotten. And it's so mm -hmm. sad that it, it's, it, it took something like Star Trek Continues to really make me want to appreciate my time with these movies even more. I do want to watch more good movies than bad, but there's still like a love I have of really bad movies. Like <laughs> you'll know, you'll know them when you see them. It, it, yeah. it's, it's, I don't really watch a lot of porn. My porn is bad movies. And so like when you see the really bad movies, they're like, Oh, Bruce is, Bruce is watching his version of porn, whatever it is that you really enjoy your, your, your guilty pleasure. You know, that's that's basically like something like you really could probably study an encyclopedia instead, but you're going to watch Band of the Hand. OK, Bruce, I see how you value an hour and 40 minutes. So, well, you know, Bruce, yeah, you know, Bruce, what's great, too, then is uh, like Janet said, when you guys saw the first episode of Star Trek Continues, it brought back the actor who played Apollo in Who Mourns for Adonai. And mm -hmm. I was like. That made me, I, um, I kid you not, as soon as I saw that first episode, I wanted to go back and watch the original. Exactly. <laughs> Which had Apollo in there. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, so cool. And, and, and uh, you know, it made you want to do that. And and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but if you haven't seen the last two-parter of Continuous where the Espers came back, but once you watch those last two episodes, you want to go back to No Man Has Gone Before and where uh, – you know, Kirk was fighting Gary Mitchell, and and uh, you know, I, it was it was just such, it was such great memories. And like I said, it, it it definitely brings closure not only to what you saw in the original series, but what it can what would have been what would have been the potential for it to continue as an additional season that Roddenberry yeah. wanted but never got, and yeah. then it just and it completes it perfectly. It really does. I, completely I it out there yeah yeah it closes sure. the gaps which i really oh uh, yeah oh by far by far like i said it, I if you take job. turnabout intruder here's the thing you take turnabout intruder which is the last episode right mm -hmm. uh of, of the original series from season three you go from there and you go right to continues and it takes right from where janice lester and kurt switch back bodies sorry honey and it goes right back to where they, you know, switch back to their bodies and Janice gets taken away and it starts right from there. So if you did that, it's like season four right there. Yeah. It's just perfect. It is. I, I and people say, say it's that. not canon, but like I said, Gene Roddenberry's own son said, yes, it's canon. My dad would have said so. Hey, that's good enough for me. I don't care what I, anybody else ever said about it. Saying it's a fan film, it's not canon. Yes, it is. It's canon. Yeah. Roddenberry's own son confirmed it. He was on the set. He worked with people. You know, they dedicated they dedicated lives and hours, their lives and hours to put together great uh, you know, form of television. They even used the old Peacock. You remember when it was on NBC? They used that to open every every uh, episode of the series, of the fan series. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's like going back in time. It was like a time machine. It was cool. Yeah, you have to see all of them, Janet. Absolutely, you and Bruce. Yeah, sure. we have. We've seen we've the, uh, the episode one. Put in the chat, we've got the old link or the link for uh, Star Trek Continues Review. Right nice. There. So awesome. um, to wrap up the, the discussion on Amazon from Amazon Women from the Moon, I got to talk about some very, uh, the very, like, title portion of it um the, the 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 props are very 1950s-esque actually more 1930s buster crab yeah. flash gordon bluff rogers-esque uh, yeah. Um, yeah i love 
I loved it. I know this sounds bad. But no, I thought it was no. great. I loved it. I I you remember, yeah, you remember when Bruce Crabb showed up as a pilot on Buck Rogers in the 25th century? Yeah, in 1979. Shortly yeah. Death. Yeah. Yeah, that was fantastic. And I loved him. I mean, Buster guy. Crab was my guy. Yeah, I'd watch all the serials when I was a little kid. They'd have these Saturday morning serials of, you know, Buck Rogers and early Batman and all the stuff I was watching, you know, as a little kid and, uh, you know, and Three Stooges and all this stuff. I loved all that stuff, all that old stuff. The Just thing is, the one thing about this uh, movie that I, I, I still am trying to understand it because it really didn't, um, it still hasn't clicked yet, but I'm sure it will. Uh, it's why they named it Amazon Women on the Moon when so little of the movie is actually about that. Is that, 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 that I'm showing you Maybe what you can answer, was. Bruce, because I could probably, I could give you an was idea was why. It, was it because it was uh, basically showing you what it was like when all these people were young and how hard it was to actually watch any movie on television because of all the commercials. And now we have streaming. So yeah. now that we have streaming, we, we don't we don't even have to have any commercials. You can Part record it. it now without a single commercial and get to sit and watch the whole thing, just like if you were at the movie theater. It's, it's part of it, Janet. And the main part of why they called it this is because they could not call it Kentucky Fried Sequel. Right. Oh, that's right. You did tell me that already. I remember yeah. you telling me that. Okay, yeah, but the other, but the other part I'll add to the to that what Bruce said uh, was also I, I learned that John Landis was really even when he was putting this together he was really into the movies like Forbidden Planet, uh, Man on the Moon, uh, well, you know that the, the fifty foot you know the fifty foot woman you know all of like you said some of the cheap even the day the Earth stood still right the original so he took like all of that and he said hey I can make a sequel to Kentucky Fried, but maybe improve upon it a little bit. And at the same time, I'm still paying homage to all these 50s and 60s films I grew up with in college when I was going, you know, there in California and, mm -hmm. you know, eventually into film school, you know, with guys like Lucas and Spielberg and all that. And he says, I could do this. He says, I could do this. So, you know, uh, it was a homage mostly, yeah. And it was nice. Well, it wasn't a bad I film. I love... Uh, my mother loved uh, musicals, okay? So I grew up watching lots of musical stuff, like Victor so Victoria uh, and things like that, because my mom just loved uh, that type of stuff. So right. when I got to see this, it reminded me a lot of a lot of the uh, stuff that my mother and I would watch together. But it also reminded me of things that I watched with my dad, because he liked the old campy um, westerns and uh, the, uh, uh, some of the sci-fi stuff. So my mother was never really into anything that she said, if it's not realistic, that I think it's stupid. So she didn't like Star Trek, things like that. But my dad did. And I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was one of my very favorite things that I'm just hooked on anything sci-fi. You know, I love all of that aspect of going to space and uh, just uh, aliens, you know, uh, the movie aliens, all the horror sci-fi, the thing, uh, you know, all those things. I, I, I love all that. And if I, if that's the only, if I had to pick one kind of movie that I could watch for the rest of my life and that would be it, that would be it. It'd be sci-fi. So oh, yeah, uh, sci -fi. It's, if it's they still sci -fi. can make any, that's good. It would, I would have to just keep watching all the old stuff. But um, yeah. this movie, what to me, I thought they did a wonderful job at throwing a, a collage basically of uh, a eclectic, handful of just totally different stories and then putting them all together with old commercials of selling albums, uh, selling wares, uh, uh, different, you know, products to buy, you know, things like that. And then they kept telling you that they weren't going to interrupt the movie again, even though they did, you know, uh, it was, I just thought it was really, really, really good. I thought they did a great job. It reminded me of so many different things uh, that we've all been through at some time in our life, you know, that you waiting for your movie to start. You've already halfway eaten all your popcorn and we're still waiting because we're having technical difficulties, you know, that because you have all those delays. Yeah. Well, you remember, I get, I think you remember in the day where they used to have especially when you were in a drive-in theater, you had those uh, coming attractions and then you had the 
dancing popcorn, the dancing drink, hot dog. the dancing <laughs> hot dog. Hot dog. I so love I that. Eric, should I show that right now? That's our oh, yeah, that's you got a yeah. thing of it? Sure, go ahead, Bree. <laughs> that's our family friendly intermission we have. Yeah, that we do. Yeah, like during our games. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the non family. Like, friendly let's friendly let's friendly go to the family. lobby. Let's have ourselves a drink. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. Let's go to the lobby and have ourselves a drink. Yeah. Some popcorn yeah. and some popcorn. I, I don't remember all the because there were different ones. They had different, uh, you know, different little jingles that went with a different one, uh, yeah. different movie theaters. So okay, let's take a look. Yeah. Tasty and refreshing snacks. Remember this? Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> with the hot butter. Yes. Minutes. Anyone can buy lush TV's. It always makes you want popcorn. Plenty of time before the movie starts. Right so visit our snack bar right now. Like, oh, Castleberry's pit barbecue sandwiches. <laughs> pit cook barbecue. Still plenty pit of time cooks. to come and be served at the refreshment center before showtime. Oh, so okay. show starts in three minutes. Yeah, this I, I love this because this takes you right back to 1980, 1970. Oh, it, there's so many beautiful memories back then. See you know, all that out there. <laughs> um, yeah, my favorite, my, some of my favorite times alone that I enjoyed was at a drive-in theater, and there were there at one time there used to be so many around the Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona area, and I went to one in Scottsdale, which I hope is still there because it's called Scottsdale Six. Uh, and, uh, I would, you know, it's, it's so wide open and, uh, I'd seen a few sci-fi movies there. Uh, there was one over in Phoenix, which was on the side of a mountain. Uh, and I actually saw one of the, uh, Star Wars films there, uh, which was so cool. You know, it's like all laid out and everything. Uh, but yeah, like you said before, Janet, all of those are just going away because eventually when they're all mowed down and taken apart which is the saddest part of our old heritage and how we enjoyed it in our mm -hmm. times you know and yep. when yep. that's all gone what what do we do you know what do you do after that it'd be just like some of the things what was that movie we watched where they were all in these little trailer houses all stacked on top of each other and they had the uh oculus the internet. on it ready player one Ready player yeah, one. Ready Player One. Basically, that is where we're all going to live in little tiny houses because you don't need to do anything. You, you you have a replicator that makes your food. You you have your your TV that you wear on your head, and you're it's yeah. immersive. So I, you know, I hope we don't. That's why I, don't I really believe that. in the Matrix. I really believe that if we're not careful, we could end up just like that, where people pay to be put in this machine and just live out their whole lives with your fed and everything, and you don't really interact or do anything. It's all in here. Yeah, your body let's hope that like, Yeah, let's hope that doesn't it happen. Around to us and that happens, but I I do believe that that one day that could be possibly be what people want to do. They'll go and they'll sign up. And they'll have jobs and everything, technical jobs that they just use your mind for. But basically, you're just batteries. You're yeah. collect electricity from all the people that's being fed sludge or whatever in your in your <laughs> gut. And, and, and that's cool. Yeah. And it's gross, but that's basically what the, the matrix was, was just a battery to keep everything running. And the people were thinking they were living their lives because it was all in their minds. So yeah, that's I don't cool. want, I don't want to live that way. Was, that's why when you wake up, just like when they say you red pill or blue pill, if you take this one pill, you're awake. It's just like when Eve took a bite of the apple, she now had the knowledge uh, that, yeah. you know, there was more out there than what just living in uh, Eden and doing, you know, and running, I, running, 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 frolicking right. around. Uh, there was right. real a real world out there. So. Uh, you can either take a bite and live the real world, or you can go and be in the fantasy world. It's your choice. No, I want to. I want to live in the reality. <laughs> no fantasy That's because for me. you I'm lived fine. it. But if you'd never lived in reality, or and then you did, all of a sudden were taken out of it and given a small portion of what reality was, you might decide to go back. So, you know, that's, that's why that's I thought true. The Matrix was such a good movie is because it had yeah. so many aspects of real life and the oh, possibility. Oh, no, yeah, I agree with you. Movie. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, we own them. We actually own all four. We got Matrix uh, uh, Revolution or uh, Resurrection, uh, the mm -hmm. fourth one. 
Yeah, we, we just got that. So we have all four. Yeah. I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, she's a big fan of Matrix. Yeah. Tell Janet us, loves Matrix. What our, our second daughter's name is. Oh, yeah. Our second daughter's, we have two cats, right? And our second mm -hmm. daughter's name is Deja Vu from mm -hmm. the Matrix. The black cat yeah. that was on the stairwell. Yes. Yep. We named her Deja Vu. <laughs> yep, we all have that at some point in time in our yeah, lives. Yeah. It's a real thing. Yeah. The last thing I'm going to ask, if the party that's in the chat right now, people from Twitter, Peter Poole from YouTube, everybody give us your scores for the Amazon Women on the Moon. Yes. And I want to hear either, you know, A plus, B plus, one out of 10, a thousand percent, whatever, whatever your rating is, we'll read it aloud. We will read it aloud. Um, the other thing is that the very... The last two pieces I want to talk about is the the B movie queens that were in this film. Um, yes. right, about <laughs> there were a lot of them. Monique Gabriel, the the young the young Miss from the first part of the movie that mm -hmm. she's also in Deathstalker two, a very fine bad movie from Argentina. Or Argentina. Uh, then you've also got uh, <laughs> Sybil Danny, who was a screen queen, a B movie queen, and she was supposed to be the the lead female in Octopussy, but that went to Maude Adams instead. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Well, Maude Adams was Maybe also she kissed somebody else and she didn't sleep with the right person. Because that oh, happens a lot. You that. go in, you <laughs> get picked out of five people to have a part. And you go in and you get talked to, and you find out later on by one of the secretaries, or they say, well, you look too much like his ex-wife. That's the only reason why yeah. you didn't get the part. So I mean, I mean well, the the director okay, is well, always right. So it doesn't matter if if uh, you're the very best actress yeah. or actor. If the director doesn't want you for whatever the reason, you won't get it. I'm just yeah, saying, Maude Adams. Maybe. Yeah, I, I just want to tell you a quick thing about Maude Adams. Now I know she did uh, the Man with the Golden Gun, and then she went in and did Octopussy. So she did two films, but she was also uncredited in a background scene from a view to a kill. She's on the, she's on a San Francisco street when Roger Moore gets off the golden, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, tri the car, the, go the, you know, the gate, the car itself. And he gets off and she's in the background. She's there, but it's uncredited. So she actually appeared in three films. I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, but yeah, when Sybil was trying to get it, the thing was is that Maude Adams, at that time when she came in, Maude Adams was not only uh, a, 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 a regular actress, she was also a floor model and a display hand model. So yeah. apparently when they did, chem when they did, um, you know, the, uh, what do they call it? The uh, interplay between Moore and her, the chemistry just clicked. Like it didn't really click for Sybil. And maybe I, I'm not sure why, but I know that when Maud and Moore acted together in their, uh, you know, what is that word, uh, Janet? The one I'm missing that, it, you know, before they go together on screen, it's like a, chemistry? well, not just chemistry. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's their uh, actors. Uh, I forget it. Oh, like man. Chemistry? Off screen chemistry? Yeah, well, no, yeah, they like had the chemistry, that. but it was uh, like a rehearsal. And they, they give it another name for besides being a rehearsal. You know, it was like a, uh, you know, uh, audition. That's it. So oh, they had an audition okay. tape. So when they're going out for the parts. Exactly. Once so when Maude they're came they're in, right. <laughs> right. So when Maude came in, she. You know, she was already familiar with, uh, you know, uh, Lois Maxwell, you know, played Money Penny. She mm -hmm. knew some of the people that actually worked on a few of the older films with Connery. So she really wanted to be a part of it. She was really trying to get herself into the role. And when they did the audition tapes with her and more, you could see that automatic chemistry. It was just like right there, which is why mm -hmm. when she came back for Octopussy that, and more was still acting as James Bond, he asked her back to be in that film. That's why she came back for a second time. Yeah. Oh, not bad. I mean, yeah, she, she's I not a slouch in the looks, but I just, I like Sybil Oh, Daniel. no, no. She's great looking. Yeah, no, she was back then. Still is kind of now, except, you know, of course she's older, but, you know. <laughs> it happens. We all get older. 
Um, um, then you've got civil. Go ahead, Bruce. So you were saying about uh, grades and stuff. Yeah, we got Sybil Danning as the queen. And she's also yeah. been in some other really great films. Uh, just just to, to name a few, we'll just take the top four off of IMDb. Battle Beyond the Stars, which is amazing schlock. She plays St. X-Men. <laughs> she's in Halloween from 2007 as Nurse mm -hmm. Wynn. She was Adriana yep. and Hercules from 1983. And she played yes. in The Three Musketeers. One of my favorites that she did uh, right before... This there was a uh, a little known film called Warrior Queen, which I got to see on USA oh, all night with uh, I think it was uh, Gilbert Godfrey, and she's also in Howling Part Two. Your sister is a werewolf, which is not a good movie. I love movie. the Howling movies, but that's such a good movie for physical effects. So I gotta say I love that film, mm -hmm. and I, it, <laughs> it, was, it was such a good cheesy movie. I liked it. She was mm -hmm. she's in a lot of bad movies. She was in Street Hawk. Do you remember Street Hawk kids? Oh uh, yeah, Street Hawk, uh, yeah. I do. Yeah. Night Rider. And then the saddest part about this movie is Lana Clarkson played uh Alpha Beta, I believe is her name. And Lana yeah. Clarkson was the young Buxton lady who she was an up and comer and she died not too long into the two thousands, thanks to Phil Spector. The record producer shot her. Oh, at yes. A Phil Spector murdered her, didn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's yeah. the one with the crazy hair. Yep. Yep, okay. that's him. I thought it was a yeah. wig. He, and yeah. he's the, the one, one that killed he her? Was the one who almost ruined. Uh, Phil Spector was the one who almost ruined the Beatles' last album. <laughs> yeah, I basically consider it he did ruin the last album because it just sounds like okay, shit. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Bruce. That was her with that the hair faucet hairstyle. Oh, geez. Yes. Now, yeah, Bruce, I'm glad I found a kindred spirit who agrees that Phil Spector destroyed the last Beatles album. Yeah. Before they yeah. got back together in 94. So, yeah. yeah. He died in February 3rd, 2003. Phil Spector got arrested, drug his feet on that. that, that I mean, that you want to, if you guys want to get away with murder, be rich. Just be rich. Okay. It took so was, he, was he drunk or something when it happened? Jealous. He was jealous. He, he threatened he so many jealous. girls with a gun. Throughout his uh, career, Janet, that so I other remember women, seeing uh, something about that, but I, I don't, I didn't watch it or anything. Well, he threatened. He, had, according to his history, he did threaten some major stars that were coming up in Motown. You know, I think he went after Diana Ross. He went after uh, Anita Ward. He went after like a bunch of like uh, even Tina Turner got some of his wrath. Um, you know, when she split no, from Ike, know. and I was like, oh, just, you know, just, just crazy stories you would hear about Phil, but you never believed him. And then, of course, uh, as soon as women were coming forward, you know, not from just music like backgrounds, but from act actresses, mm -hmm. actual actresses that met him, and they were all telling you horror stories, and you had to start believing, like, wait, maybe this guy is insane, and, you know, did all this stuff. And then, of course, he kills that, that you know, beautiful young actress, so. Yeah, it just. See, yeah, I, wow. I couldn't remember why. She, I thought it was an accident that he dropped the gun or something like that. And that's why he shot her because he just looked no. like a skinny little dweeby weirdo, you know? Right. So I, well, didn't, I, I just saw snapshots here and there. I didn't really pay that much attention to any of it. Yeah. The only thing, the only thing that separates him from OJ, who just recently passed, the only thing that separates him is the fact he got caught, but OJ didn't. So take you know, take that what you will, but that's the thing, you know. That's OJ was that's supposed the separation. To the Do you realize that, Mikey? Uh -uh. What's that? When they wrote the script for the Terminator, OJ Simpson was supposed to be the Terminator. He was, yeah. I yeah, but uh, I guess oh, apparently no. he, he yeah, he was he was supposed to be the Terminator, but apparently the, the casting director and director and everybody involved at in the early stages didn't think OJ could pull it off. Neither did a judge. Right. That's right. <laughs> now, you know what? We see him. We, uh, Suzanne and I own a lot of good films, and we own the Naked Gun series with Leslie Nielsen, who also passed away, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, but we own those three films, and they have to be the funniest films I've seen in a long time, other than like Airplane and Airplane 2, which, of course, by the way, featured Shatner, 
he says, why does the cellular lead tell me about these things? And then he opens up the <laughs> thing. <laughs> I play, he plays Roger Murdoch. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's hilarious in that one. I, I love yeah, Shatner, he was in the second one. When they were on the moon, and he opens up, why does somebody tell me about these things? You know, and it's just a bridge, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so, uh, like I said, with, with the Naked Gun films, you know, uh, Drebin, of course, played by Nielsen, and then they had OJ was the, he was the, you know, uh, detective in the in the group there in Police Squad, uh, which were great, you know, little things. You remember Police Squad, right, Bruce? Oh, my gosh. Um, funny as hell, especially with the uh, siren that's going through the uh, streets and go, da -na, da -na. Do you want me to read the scores? Yeah. Let's go. Okay, Flady has graded a solid 6.5. Okay. And he said, Yeah, it was a close to Russ Myers flick for the volume of titties. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I thought that was funny. And then oh, Six funny. Nation says 69. Percent for the nude bit, 65% overall. Nice nostalgia trip, great detail, and past. It wasn't stale like some old comedies, more like day old bakery type stuff. It was funny, <laughs> corny, and entertaining. That's great. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was good. And then I'm just going to give it a solid 7.0 out of 10. I'll I'll go you one That's better. Nice I cool. gave it actually a seven point five out of ten, and back in the day when I saw it, I actually gave it a B plus because I thought it was pretty funny. But you know, I was biased because later on, you know, uh, well, because before, you know, like I said, I had seen the airplane films and thought they were absolutely hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and those came out before this did, I believe. And then it was just like, you know, um, there's been a few other funny comedies. There's uh, Click with Adam Sandler and Kate Beckinsale. We own it, and it's a great comedy and a great drama, too. And I mean, it's just, you know, Amazon Women, I would say, in my estimation, fell kind of in the middle. And that's really not fair because I think it could have been a standalone film. So, yeah, that was my score. I would have gone 7.5. Well, in the one thing I would like to see us do if it's a movie that one of us hasn't seen, Bruce, I think we should watch the trailer. Uh, you know, like, can we show the trailer at the end of our show for the next week uh, yeah. for the movie that we're going to watch? Because uh, I went in this totally blind, you know, because I was thinking it was about, you know, when I looked up set photos for Amazon Women on the Moon, I was looking for pictures of the women from Mars or from mo the moon. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't anything at all. I was totally shocked when Arsenio Hall opened up and he was going through all the bad luck. And stuff because I was like, what's going on? This has nothing to do with Amazon Women on the Moon. So it, it kind of threw me for uh, a loop basically because I wasn't prepared because I had no idea that it was a spoof basically movie, you know, with commercials and things like that from a, a bad movie being shown on television. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, uh, right before yeah. we, before and you'd start. seen it, you'd seen it before though, right? What? You'd seen this movie before? Uh, part of it. I didn't get okay, to see all of it. Yeah, I've never well. seen it. I'd never even heard of it, basically. So, well, let's take a look because let's see if I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen lots of films, so yeah, let's take a look at the trailer there, Bruce. Uh, what trailer did you want to look at? The one for next week or no? Yeah. What What are we doing next week? I don't remember. Well, next week this is your choice, not mine. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say anything negative here. Hold on, guys. Oh, no. It's uh, another one you don't want to watch. Do, uh, the, let me, oh, let me read sorry. Yay. Fair use is a doctrine in the United States law that permits limited use of copyright material without having to first acquire permission from the copyright holder. Fair use. Hey, YouTube, fucking listen to me, you cunt. Fair use is one of the limitations to copyright intended to balance interests of copyright holders with the public interest in a wider distribution and use of creative works by allowing as defense to copyright infringement claims <clears throat> that, cer that certain limited uses might otherwise be considered infringement. U.S. fair use doctrine is generally broader than fair dealing rights known in most countries and inherited mm -hmm. English common law. The fair use right is a general exception that applies to all different kinds of uses with all types of works. In the U.S. fair use right exception is based on a flexible proportionality test that examines the purpose of the use, the amount used, 
and the impact on the market of the original work. This is all de derived from the 1700s BS of uh, legalese. So with that being stated, let me go to this right here. Now this is a fantastic film. It's a music, oh, it's a part no, movie, so part musical. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to this because it's a Burt Reynolds movie. Look at that womb broom that man has. Yeah, but Dolly. come on. I mean, when when have you you don't see Dolly Parton in very many films act? So for, and, and Dom DeLuise, the great Dom DeLuise, oh, who died oh soon God. after he made Wait. this thing. So, so excited. Yeah, I'm excited. It's yeah. a great film. And if you'd be honored to have me, I would love to be with you guys next week to uh, review this film because I've seen it and it's just it's fantastic. I love this film. I uh, I, I got to I, I got to talk with Janet about some things after this. We'll see what happens. But I mean, I've enjoyed today's stream. You guys were talking quite a bit. The only negative I have is that you two talk over each other a lot. I know Janet used to having four sisters, and you got to get your words <laughs> in edgewise. That's why whenever Janet's on. I just learned to just just be quiet, let her take a breath, and go in, and I'm that sorry. works well. But the two of you guys kind of been doing bumper cars on the vocals, and I think I think this is going to be a very interesting film to watch. Uh, we'll be doing the the, the seen what, it. The, what? You haven't seen it? Nope. Nope. Oh, I'm excited then. I'm so yeah. excited. This is a good movie. Have the best for us in Texas. Yeah. Have you seen it yourself, Janet? Have mm -hmm. you seen it? Have yeah, you seen it, Jane? Many, many awesome. times. It was my mom, one of my mom's favorite movies. She loved Burt Reynolds. She loved Dolly Parton. And yeah, this is definitely one of my mom's favorite movie musicals, too. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah, some questionable my stuff. Watched <laughs> lots of, uh, my mom watched lots of uh, musicals with me. It's like I said, Victor Victoria was one of them. This is one of them. There's a few others, Nine to Five, right. uh, and a few others that my mom just got me hooked to him so I, i'm excited about bruce getting to see this because i don't know why we were talking about burt reynolds about some other movie and we were talking about burt, burt reynolds and that's when i said oh we need to watch that movie with burt reynolds it's it's called nine to five with with dolly Parton. i think that it's gonna be a good movie to put on the list i was yeah, a while no, back though so uh I don't yeah know now wasn't burt reynolds in studio 54 uh, if you think of a more mo uh, Modern. I don't know. I didn't see that then. one, so I don't. Yeah, I, I don't believe know. he was in there with Mike Myers, if I remember correctly. Hmm. I think it was Burt Reynolds, one of his last films he did before he passed, if I recall correct. I don't have to look it up myself. Oh, Brett, I think he uh, was in that. Brett saying that uh, loved Rhinestone with Stallone and Dolly. I hadn't seen that one. That's a good one. I've seen that one too. Yes, it, it is good. And, and you know what? You what you're surprised by is you didn't think Sly Stallone could sing. Well, he held his own with Dolly. So yeah, good story. Stallone is the ultimate man for Tinseltown. As much as I don't like his politics, which I don't like anybody's politics but my own, um, even people that are on quote with my side, uh, I like the fact that he can edit, he can film, he can cast, he can direct. He can produce, he, he, he can completely handle all aspects in front and behind the camera. He doesn't have a weak point. He's a great performer. I think that is so much of what's missing in today's world. When we see somebody that's actually got some a little smidgen of talent, we get like envious of them because we can't do that. You know, well, I'm not envious of Taylor Swift because she can gather millions of idiots called Swifties. I'm envious of the fact that like they would have something young and pretty with zero substance instead of having something that would like have some actual substance. We don't have women that sing like Dolly Parton in today's society. Mm -hmm. We have women that aspire to look like Dolly Parton in today's society, yeah. but then they get trashy and start, start to twerk everywhere, and then the entire culture is just shot to shit. Sorry, kids, but well, I I can't wait to see this movie. But yes, well, I, uh, Sylvester yeah, Stallone. Ahead. You're talking about Sylvester Stallone, right? I am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he can also write because he wrote a few of the movies that he wrote. He wrote the so, uh, screenplay for Rocky. He's the original very, Rocky. very talented when it comes to yeah. anything to do with Hollywood. Uh, you know, and his brother, I'm sure, has tried many, many times to fit into that genre somehow. He just cannot. Uh, you know, you know, Frank is a better singer. He has, his brother Frank but, is actually uh, a better singer than actor. So. Sly says, as long as Frank is singing and I'm acting, we're fine. 
That's but, what he uh, said. Yeah. We heard him say it in uh, an interview. I was like, okay. I'm you know. looking forward to uh, this next week, Bruce, a lot. I, and I would love to join you, Janet and Bruce. I'm going to do whatever I have to to make sure I'm in the in the Discord with you when you watch this movie because I want to. Yes. Uh, I just want to hear your reaction to it because this is a, a really good movie. If anybody has seen it or hasn't seen it, that's in the chat, and you would like to watch it with us next Sunday uh, in Bruce's Discord, we always watch the movie. Uh, before we review it. So uh, I don't know for short time, you'll have to keep an eye on his his channel uh, about what, what his plans are, but uh, you can join us. It's a lot of fun. Six Nations was there today too, wasn't he? Yep, Six Nations and uh, Flady. And Flady, Flady was in there. there. So we, we, have, we have some people that come try to come every week and watch with us. Uh, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good, but it's fun because you get to hang out with each other and we talk. And we laugh and, you know, depending on what's going on. So it's a lot of fun if you yeah. haven't done it. Um, I, I really do. I'm looking forward to this because I, I like Burt Reynolds a lot. The more I see him in films, the more I really enjoy his body of work. And what a, what a great treasure he left us, you know, to be able to watch him two or three hours at a time. I, I think he's just fantastic in the films I've seen him in. This I expect to be no less. This is what I expect to see. Oh, my final rating for today's show, Amazon uh, Women from the Moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know I could be a better shitlord. I'm sorry. Um, I need I, I need to say this, that we watch Spaceballs, and the more I think about Spaceballs, the lower it rates. I hate to say that because that was a fun movie when I was a young kid, but I didn't really have a good basis right. of what was great Mel Brooks. I haven't seen the entire Mel Brooks library yet. You want to see that when you're at a few different stages in life. And Spaceballs just didn't hold up. I want to say it now probably is around a 55 or 58%. There's some really good parts of it. it. It completely falls apart for me as a comedy or as anything that might be considered plot driven. There's some great special effects there that holds me to it. Uh, a lot of the other items in that movie, like uh, Daphne Zuniga, whatever her name is, I she could have been played by any brunette. Sorry, mm -hmm. Janet, you're completely oh, right. I, I agree, Daphne Zuniga. Yeah, she could have been played by anyone. Her part for sure. Yeah, she, she yeah. Had a, but we can't. But but I, 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 that was one of the last time. Yeah. Yeah, but you can't uh, replace uh, the voice of Joan Rivers with for Dot Matrix. That uh, that yeah, was fantastic. great casting. That was great casting. Loved uh, her. I I want to say this movie's a solid 70 or 72 for me. I mean, for a lot of people like, oh, it's low. Why isn't it 10 out of 10 or 100 percent No, this is a this is an easy three, three and a half star film for me. Because yes. in light of all the things that were going on at the time, the fact it got made the way it was, the, the fact that it was as zany as it is, and it completely preserves the 80s style of comedy, which had been this has probably been lingering in a, a, a producer's. The script was lingering somewhere in a desk somewhere. And I don't see it where they directed it fresh. This was hanging around since the late 70s. And they're like, man, I want to do something like Blackfin or SCTV. What the fuck, man? And I could see them gnashing teeth trying to figure out how they could make this their own. And once it all started falling together, like, we'll get five different directors. It'll be a real short uh, time for us to film it all. And then, bam, there we go, instant money. And then the more they played with it, the more like, I don't know if this is going to work or not. John Landis is attached to it. And finally they said, well, it's going to just be easier for us to release this on home video and cable. And they only made $500,000 out of $5 million. So I got to say, as much as like they may have lost money, I think over the course of time, a lot of people that hear about this film or they watch this yeah. film, they see the star list, they see the skits. They If they have an appreciation for movies that were made at the time they will value this movie a lot more than if they were like you know oh the, the the oldest comedy i watch is something about mary and that movie there barely qualifies there's a lot of gross out comedy the guy cuts his balls in his zipper you know if, if that's their fucking opinion they're a garbage individual they just need to stay on TikTok, and that's all they can say <laughs> yeah i i have to say though one thing about the one thing great about mel brooks is and we only have a few films and gosh i hope that suzanne and i can get the whole collection like every film he has he's ever put out 
uh, the great thing about Mel Brooks I've always found is that if you have a terrible day, I mean, absolutely terrible, could be the worst possible day of your life or your terrible week, and all of a sudden you put in one of those Mel Brooks, like say, for example, Robin Hood Men in Tights, and you're happy again. That's, that's you're a great happy movie. again. That's, that's They're like, oh, my God, just so much good stuff. Yeah, just funny. So it's that, good that, to be the thing. Yeah, it's good to be the thing. Uh, I like I like that. I like the history of the world volume one. Of course, Young Frankenstein and and oh, of uh, course. and and Blazing Saddles. But there's really I'm having a hard time. Like I guess my fifth favorite Brooks film would be The Producers, and those yes. are my top five Mel Brooks movies. The Producers from 1973 or 72 is. Oh yeah, who more. didn't like The Producers? I, and that had Zero Mostel. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, okay, cool. <laughs> so it, it's a very good film if, if you've yeah. not seen it we'll probably have to watch that in the future because that's one that not oh, a whole lot of people have seen and I think that giving the people the opportunity to view it again is, is definitely a must do because that is such a fun movie who doesn't love and, fucking okay, dance and, and uh, Tree Rock Creations there I want to address his real quick when he say he liked Blazing Saddles well don't forget that in Robin Hood Men and Dites they said a black sheriff and the guy says yeah it worked in Blazing Saddles <laughs> he broke the fourth wall yeah he yeah. said that in the movie and I was like wow I was like Mel just he he went to the well but he didn't have to go too often He he's such a comic genius and uh well, he's like uh, he's almost as old as Shatner right now, right? He's like in his ninety-five. Uh, his, yeah, 95 yeah, 96. yeah. He's older than Shatner. Then, wow, yeah. Oh, yeah. History of the World Part One, and wait, History of the World Part Two. <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. I need, I need to at some point, but I'm worried because it was made in 2023, and I don't know if I. Yeah, yeah. It. I'm a little worried about that myself. Uh, I, I had. I had a friend tell me that he said, you know, I I wanted to like Ghostbusters, the Frozen, whatever threat, whatever that was. Frozen like Empire, really it was very good. Yes, uh, Susan and I saw it recently. It's very good. I, I we liked the movie. I thought I, it completed everything, made a complete closure of the uh, of the franchise. It was perfect. My my yeah. friend said he's like, I think it should have been twelve episodes on Netflix or Hulu because there's a lot they throw at you and it doesn't really tie up that neatly a series would have better produced it would have been better produced maybe if it. it was done right but they didn't have the they didn't have the capable enough writers to put together a series bruce that's why they only did the film uh that was my understanding okay i mean if, if that's the case that's that's the case but i just from everything i've heard and i'm not seeing it yet i'm not going to see it because no offense i hate it afterlife i i love afterlife <laughs> I'm I, sorry. I, I, I loved Afterlife. It was great. We owned it. We own it. So it's, yeah, it's a perfect homage to Harold Ramis. And that's what I, it is. Harold Ramis tribute film. That's all it is. That's all I'll, it is. I'll invite you back for our Afterlife. We're going to do that in October. Because um, cool. we're going to we're gonna definitely watch that. Again. And, I, and I'm going to analyze it. Right now, my biggest problem is the female Wesley Crusher Velma wannabe in it. And <laughs> yeah, that's, makes that's, really great. Uh, yeah. yeah, everybody says that about her. Everybody says that about her because of her glasses. It's because of who her dad is. It, it's it's okay. I'm okay with her being nearsighted or unable to see because her dad was unable to see. There, if you look at World War II history, <laughs> our heroes of World well, War that was II, her grandpa, not her dad. Her. But yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, um, was I, grandpa. I, grandpa put, I sent you something, on. Bruce, in okay. Discord. Um, okay. because uh, I was going to talk about what I got planned for this next week. Yes. Okay. Because uh, I got in the normal Friday night shit show on Friday at, at 9, 10 uh, central time. But I have a new show that I'm going to try out with somebody that used to be in radio. Uh, and he helped me make a little uh, video to, to, to talk about it because I'm going to do it uh, Thursday night. At it's going to be eight central, but nine uh, his time, which is uh, he's an hour ahead of me. So we're going to uh, try it out and see if it works. I'll be so, happy to listen to it Friday morning at two a.m. So I uh, I sent you a video so you could play it on here because I have it on my my YouTube channel and I have it on my uh, other my Rumble my other stuff too. So 
because it'll be aired on X, YouTube, and um, on uh, Rumble when we do when we do the show. All right, let me share. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. saw that about Eddie Murphy, and I think, yeah, or Ernie Hudson is much it. better doing that role. Yeah, yeah, much better doing Winston Zettimore. seeing what you do in the future because I know that you are going to be if you continue in social media you're going to be amazing uh, that's, well, that's how it is. I, I'm only doing this like I said I'm only going to do stuff that I want to do anything that um you know to talk about things that I think are important you know child trafficking uh, stuff I'll have to do that on rumble because we already know that I can't really do much on YouTube they don't really like it when you uh, push any buttons or envelopes so but uh, yeah. then Saturday, I'll be here on Bruce's channel again, and Bruce can tell everybody what we're planning on doing next weekend. Next weekend is the Alpha Group uh, continuation as the party continues to delve through the city of Stoneholm. It will be an interesting uh, day as we attempt to see what other mysteries lay in wait for the party as they try to un unfurl what has gone on before and why is the city having the problems with the forces of darkness and a uh, cult dedicated to dispatter the, the devil lord? Why are they so interested within this little dwarven community? And I'm looking very forward to that session of our alpha group campaign. If you enjoy uh, live plays, I do recommend you take a good listen. Our friends, Six Nation 31 Kings, Lady One Gaming, uh, the crafting gamer and poten potentially Connell from uh, Cigar DM. He will be here as well. Thank you. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, I, I know I'm already subbed to uh, Janet, Janet's mm -hmm. channel. Uh, we are Mikey Seuss 4 and we have content. We do reviews of. A team on Tuesday afternoons at four o'clock Eastern, three Central. Uh, we do a concept show. I came up with a webcam show called Mikey TV, uh, which is on Mondays, same time at four Eastern, three Central, uh, where we discuss topic of the day or the week, and also we recommend a DVD or Blu-ray from our collection of movies we have, and also we take questions from the chat. So that's available on Mondays. Uh, Wednesdays, we also do uh, a review of The Greatest American Hero. I just did a uh, binge watch of all 45 episodes. There were 44 of the original, but then there was a 45th episode where they were going to have a woman become the greatest American hero, and it didn't quite work out. So I'll be able to discuss all of those. We're currently on season one. Uh, and then on Thursdays, we do a joint review uh, my friend Jay Aldridge and I, we review the uh, the shows of Shazam and The Secrets of Isis, which came in on Saturday mornings in the mid-70s. Um, yeah, so that's at the same time. And then Fridays, of course, the last two Fridays we've done what they call topic times. And we did nostalgia times on uh, last Friday and this past Friday, yesterday, or the other Friday. Uh, we did a one-year celebration of Suzanne and I's channel. And we celebrated uh, us being on the air here on YouTube for over a year. So, yeah, it was, it's lots of fun. We're taking some time off for the next two weeks because we're celebrating our eight-year wedding anniversary next Friday. So, um, But we will be back uh, May 4th. And uh, 
the first Monday and we'll kick off everything. So yeah, please check us out. And, uh, you know, like for Bruce and Janet and us, please like that button, hit that subscribe. Uh, don't forget to share the videos with all your friends. And also please hit that notify bell. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and you can, and you can be aware and notified of any future events. I think that covers us. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, I hope you have a great May 4th or may the 4th be with you. Mikey. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to do a Star Wars topic, actually, because May 5th is when, um, you know, Star Wars will be celebrating its uh, officially its 47th anniversary. So in May, we'll be doing that. That's when we come back. will be May 4th. So, yes, when uh, when I do Monday's Mikey TV, uh, that'll be the first thing we'll talk about is uh, the Star Wars phenomenon. 47 years and kicking. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Nations. And I like the uh, comment that uh, Travis made before. He said that the Scottsdale 6 drive-in still exists. So I was like, whoa, yay. <laughs> yeah. well, I said, there are a few. There are a few. Yeah. That you can make money. It, but they've got to be able to pay, you know, all their bills and everything for it to be worth being open. Well, I think also, Janet, um, have you ever seen it yourself? Have you been in Scottsdale, Arizona before? Yeah, I've been there, but I've not been to that theater or anything. No. That particular drive-in? Okay. Well, it's iconic. It's been there since the, the, the early 1960s. So that, that drive-in's been there for at least over 60 years, at least. And it is, and it's they've now made improvements icon, over the years. Right? So What's that? It's like, it's like an icon now in that in that. It city. is. Yeah, so it's the only, it's well, it's the only one of its kind. Time. That's right. It's the only one of its kind in central Arizona. There was one other, and I don't know if it's still there, but up up, up north, on the way to Flagstaff, Arizona, they have one in a town. I think it's over near uh, what they call Camp Verde, uh, mm -hmm. and they used to have a drive-in there. And I don't and I don't know if that's still there or if it was down in Prescott. But I know the one in Scottsdale is iconic. It's been there, and it was owned by Harkins Theaters. Uh, my friend Larry knew Dan Harkins personally, and I mean he's the one who opened the Cine Capri in Phoenix, and then he moved it to Northeast Phoenix. Uh, and they brought over the big, those big, huge red uh, carpet type uh, curtains. You remember that would open, you know, when a movie was, you know, coming on, and you know that's definitely beautiful nostalgia. You know, that's a lot, a lot of stuff we got to see. So, yeah. So thanks, Travis. Thank you, Travis J. Yeah, that's that's good that it's still there. Yeah. All right, so for everybody here at the Bruce Lombardo Dix Division trailer and at part with Mikey Sues 4 and Janet from Another Planet, please visit our other socials that will be available. If you are not already a member, I do suggest you do subscribe to Janet from Another Planet. She is turning into a local, I guess you'd say like a, a, uh, a burgeoning YouTube uh information, or I wouldn't say YouTube, I would say just social media uh, star. And I think the, the more that she's able to help illuminate the truth and things that are going out there, I think the better off, the better off everybody around her is going to be. Be sure to take care of your children, your families, make sure you do everything you can to keep the food on your table, which means that you need to prepare for the things that are unforeseen ahead. My name is Bruce Lombardo. Everybody have a great and wonderful Sabbath, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Bruce and Janet, again for having me today.